Welcome to r slash Am I the Jerk, where Karen demands OP gets rid of their snakes. Am I the jerk for not getting rid of a snake on my property? I'm 30 and I live on a farm alone with goats and horses. I have at least two good-sized rat snakes living here. My niece is going to be living with me for a week to visit her friend who's moving to Japan after summer and her mother called me asking about the area and I mentioned the snakes. She told me I'd have to get rid of them because she doesn't want her daughter around evil creatures. I said no, because they've helped a lot with a mouse problem that I had. She said her daughter's not coming to visit unless I get rid of them. And I said, well, I guess she's not coming over then. And things were left a bit sour. It's unlikely that she's coming now, but I don't know how I'd temporarily get rid of them. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Nature is gonna be nature. It's not your job to eradicate a harmless snake population just to please someone who won't even be on your property. Not just harmless, but actively beneficial, although they can be trouble if you keep chickens. Not the jerk. Mother is not only being unreasonable, but clearly she's quite dumb. Evil creatures? Not the jerk. Snakes are solitary animals that don't like drama. They're just animals living their life. I never understood the evil thing. I lived among rattlesnakes and never once did one try to attack me. Am I the jerk for punishing my family by no longer doing birthdays, holidays, or vacations? When my wife and I were talking about getting married, my dad said that he would give us a down payment for a home. We were thrilled and we kept that in mind. We would be able to afford a good starter home with his help and we scrimped and saved to add to it. Except apparently he meant a sum of money good for a down payment for a house near us where the cost of living is low. He did not ever mean a down payment for a home in Colorado where my wife and I have lived since we were in college. He said he thought I would be smart enough to realize that we'd need to move somewhere with a lower cost of living than Colorado. He keeps saying, move to a cheaper city. But our lives are here, our friends, our jobs, our hobbies. You can't exactly leave your house and be up on top of a 14,000 foot peak in six hours where your family is. I told him that we had never talked about moving back there and we never would, that we would rather be stuck renting for a while longer then be stuck somewhere we didn't want to be, and the move to a cheaper city wouldn't work for us. He said, so be it, and gave us the amount and that was that. I expressed gratitude and thanked him for the money. It's still towards the goal. Well, because of this shift in our finances, we've had to make a lot of changes to save up the rest of the money. We've had to cut out vacations, birthday gifts, holidays, etc. We won't be traveling home for a few years. At our current rate, we should have an okay down payment by the end of next year. My dad confronted us about this because we won't come visit for summer break and told me that I was being a selfish entitled brat because I hadn't gotten my way. That I was essentially punishing the rest of the family because we assumed what his gift would be. I told him that I was grateful for the amount he gave us, but that it means we do need to buckle down and save every penny if we want to be able to afford a house anytime soon. Even townhouses around us are easily over 400k and that's for the sketchy ones. But is my dad right? Am I the jerk? Edit. There was no amount formally discussed. He said a down payment and that was that. For my siblings, he paid for college. He paid cash in full for my sister's house. It was $317,000. He did not pay for my college. They're invited to come here anytime, but believe it should be me to go there because I'm the one who moved. No, we do not go out to eat. Avocado toast, Starbucks, cable, etc. You're the jerk. He offered you a down payment for a home. You assumed it would be a certain amount. It wasn't. But he still gave you a generous gift. And now you describe that generous gift as doing you over. Also, while you're under no obligation to go on family trips, to cut out any visits to them for a few years after your dad gave you this generous gift because it wasn't as much as you were expecting sends a message, whether you mean it or not. Not the jerk. Money from family that comes with conditions is a straight no for me. Too many bad stories about taking money for a house and then being criticized every time you do an upgrade or spend any money for yourself. You're the opposite of selfish and entitled. You are hardworking and responsible. Well, who do you think is a jerk? OP or his dad? Please let us know. My twin sister and I, we're both 18, took a genetics test and we did not share any DNA. My twin and I are fraternal twins. Recently, we took a genetic test for fun because we wanted to see what we shared and the differences between us. Since we still share genes, fraternal twins are like siblings genetically. 
My grandparents had suggested the tests and got them for us, so our parents didn't know about it. But our results made no sense. My twins was coming up almost completely as Eastern European and Western European, which makes sense as most of my family are Croatian, German, or Austrian. So all of that would be accurate. But mine wasn't anything like that. It was almost completely Scandinavian, with some Russian and a couple of other places, neither of which were on my twins' result. She had a very small percentage of Scandinavian, but that was it, and we had no match DNA, which clearly seemed impossible. We were literally twins. We have to share DNA. My twins said that they must have mixed my sample up with someone else. We ended up contacting the company, and my twin and I took the test again. It was the same result. Both my twin and I were really confused. We told our grandparents, and they just said that that was interesting and said nothing else. My twin said we should tell our parents and see if they had ever done a genetic test or if any of our siblings had, and then we could see if somehow ours were still right. I mean, it kind of made sense I'd have Scandinavian because I'm much taller than my mother and quite a bit taller than my twin, and I'm way better at football and handball than she is. And I'm very blonde compared to the rest of my family, but I had thought it was the German. When we told our mother, she reacted almost the same way as my grandparents, but she seemed annoyed and said that they're inaccurate anyway and our grandparents shouldn't have told us to take one. And when we asked our father, he basically said nothing. I'm confused. I know my twin thinks it's just a mistake, but I don't think so. We have to share DNA, about 50%. That's how twins and siblings work. Even though we're fraternal, we should still share quite a bit of DNA. But other explanations don't make sense. My mother can't have cheated on my father because my twin and I would still share DNA, just less because we would have different fathers. The results mean we can't share a parent or even be related, but I don't see why my parents would adopt me if I'm not their kid when I don't think they've ever been to Scandinavia and why they'd adopt a baby that's almost exactly the same age as their baby. I'm panicking. The person I'm closest with in the whole world, who I thought I even shared the womb with, might not be related to me. My birthday might not even be real. None of this makes any sense and no one is telling me the truth. I'm also scared my twin might tell her boyfriend about it and then people might end up knowing that I'm some kind of fraud and my family isn't my family after all. Edit. I called the clinic where my mother gave birth to all of my siblings. The day of my birthday, my mother is in the records, but only for one birth, not two, not twins. I don't know if it's an error or my mother just didn't give birth to me. I don't think they want to tell me anything. They're all acting weird now and I heard my mother yelling at people on the phone. I don't know what's going on, but there's no way they want to tell me what it is. Sadly, my mother has given birth every time in a private clinic that's very small. She prefers it. She thinks hospitals are disgusting and she prefers knowing the doctors. So while it is possible that I was swapped at birth, I'll look into getting parental DNA done. It would be very concerning if that happened because at most, maybe three or four other women would have given birth at a similar time as her, but possible, definitely. Do your grandparents know anything about the situation? OP. Kind of. I did ask them why they suggested it and my grandmother said that it doesn't matter. I said clearly it does if the results are right, but she just said she doesn't know anything and to tell my mother that. I don't know why they deliberately upset my parents with this, but I'm only assuming that they wanted me to know. But I don't know why. I think my grandmother thinks I should figure it out myself, but I literally have no clue when no one will tell me anything at all. Update. So, I'm adopted, which was probably quite obvious as soon as I got the results but I guess I was in denial. My parents told me a couple of days ago. I know now that my mother was Danish and my father's old girlfriend from when he was really young, which is seriously weird. I asked them a lot of questions, but I didn't get answers to all of them. I don't know who my father is, how my parents were able to adopt me, and why, if she's even alive, nothing. But thankfully, I am actually legally adopted by them, which is a relief since I was worried I might not be. And my birthday is actually my birthday, so they haven't been committing any weird fraud. It's very weird. My sister has been acting weirdly and my family as well. But in some ways it's a relief. My parents still feel like my parents and my siblings like my siblings. I know that technically they're not, but I don't feel too upset about it. I'm just upset they lied and also won't tell me everything. I don't know if they genuinely don't know or don't want to talk about it, but at least I have an idea about everything now. I'm still not quite sure how I feel about it, but I'm glad I know about things now. Plus, now I have a country that's actually good at football to support, which is nice. Maybe someday I'll find out everything, maybe not. I could probably look her up and find her if I wanted to, but I'm not sure if I want to. 
Although everything is different, it doesn't feel so bad, but it does at the same time. It's just weird. But I have a family that loves me, so it could be much worse. I feel sad about my twin, since we're not actually related, which feels really different, and she's acting different as well. But I still love her a lot, and my parents as well. I think it will take some time to know how I really feel. In some ways, I want to be mad at everyone and do stupid things, but that's only sometimes. And overall, I feel okay, so that's good. And eventually, I think I'll be content with how everything is. The grandparents knew what they were doing. I bet they had been nagging the parents to tell the truth to OP for years. I, 25 female, was left millions of dollars by someone I used to casually date. So I'm still in shock writing this post and I haven't told anyone yet, not even my husband. I think the first thing I need to do is speak with my husband and then decide what we want to do. I'm not sure how we will feel about this. I'm going to go on a whole ride here because this is still so unbelievable. I, 25 female, was left millions of dollars by an older guy I used to date. Back in 2017 when I was in college, I went to Florida to spend the summer with my uncle. I used to frequent the Los Olas area and one evening I was out with some friends who lived in Florida, I met an older gentleman. I was 20 at the time, not a lot of experience with men or anything really. This guy was in his early 60s but definitely looked 45 max. We started dating and mostly I would just attend these high-end events with him like galas or yacht parties and travel around the states a lot. At this time, his wife had just passed a year ago and during the summer I met his son casually at a dinner party at his place. I would run into his son whenever I was at his place and we had a good relationship. Dating this guy was super refreshing, like a finer kind of life I was never really used to. It was just a fun time and all throughout this story we never hooked up even once. We would kiss and cuddle but we never hooked up. It was just great conversation. He told me about all of his life experiences and how he made his money. He was into real estate, investing, and the hotel industry. He gave me a lot of advice about money, etc. In the back of my mind, I knew he had money, of course, but I didn't realize he had this much. Anyway, I was in college for nursing, and at the end of the summer, I had to go back to the north for school. A few days before I left, he actually sat me down and asked me if I really wanted to finish school. He basically was asking me to quit school and move to Florida with him, and just kind of be his trophy girl, which honestly is what I was during the summer. I thought about it, and even though it seemed easy, I honestly didn't know a whole lot about this man, and I never saw myself as that person. I wanted the career and the degree and to make my own money. I never ever asked him for money or for anything at all. I just genuinely enjoyed his company. I wanted to continue to date him, however, but he said he couldn't do the long distance, and if we were going to date, he would want me to live with him. For me, it was just all too soon and the huge age gap, I wasn't sure this was something I wanted long term. We ended up going our separate ways, but we still kept in touch. Checked in on each other every couple of months, just high and by. I eventually got married. I of course told my husband about that relationship because it did mean a lot to me and I did care about him. The last time I spoke to him was about three months ago. Well, the executor of his estate contacted me a few days ago. A few hours later, his son also called me and we talked for a long time about him and how he passed. Honestly, at first, I didn't believe that it was real. But after talking with his son, wow. His son told me this guy talked about me so much and that he told him I pulled him out of a depression and sadness after his mom passed. His son told me I meant a lot to him because the time I came into his life was a really rough time and I made it better. I feel so many emotions because I never knew our relationship meant so much to him. I am very grateful he thought of me and I'm still not sure if I should accept the money. I'm a nurse and while nurses don't make millions, I make good money to live a comfortable life. My husband also has a great job as well. I will be talking with my husband about it soon. I don't really know a lot about money, but yeah, I'm still in shock. I never thought I would ever have this amount of money in my entire life. OP on how she was asked out by the older guy for dates. OP. Not romantic or filmy at all. Just a regular way people meet. We were at a restaurant that had a bar. I went up to the bar to grab some drinks for us and he was there and offered to pay for them. He asked me to sit at the bar with him and I told him I was already out with some friends. We decided to exchange numbers and he called me. We chatted for a few days and then he asked me out to lunch. Our relationship wasn't like romantic or dreamy or anything of that sort. It was just a good time. When he asked me to move to Florida, he just explained he really enjoyed my company and spending time with me and he wanted to explore where this might go. It wasn't like, I'm in love with you and I want to be with you forever type thing. That's part of the reason why I'm kind of stunned. 
Aside from talking to your husband, I'd talk to the son as well. You're in a spot where you and your family can live comfortably, granted not making any bad financial decisions. Take a month off and enjoy life. Do things he enjoyed. Take his son and just reminisce. Update. So I spoke with my husband yesterday and he said the choice of whether to accept it or not is entirely up to me. He said money like that could forever change our lives, of course, but at the end of the day, if I'm not comfortable accepting it, then I shouldn't. So I've decided to accept it. Just thinking about being able to retire my parents gives me so much joy. Thank you for all of the advice. Be willing to talk to and be flirtatious with men older than your parents, sometimes possibly even hooking up with them. Boom, get rich. OP, sometimes good companionship is more meaningful than hooking up. Not saying we both weren't attracted to each other, but it was more than that. And also, you can form lasting relationships with people your own age. There are a lot of high-value men in their 30s who will give you the world if they can and not mistreat you and take advantage of you. But of course, you should treat them the way you want to be treated. Just be genuine. I've dated men who are way well off in their 20s. There's nothing wrong with wanting to date someone who is financially capable. Society makes it seem like there is something wrong with that. I've never asked any man I've ever dated for money or other things. You become your environment and the people you hang around. I've learned a lot about investing in real estate just by being among this crowd. Sometimes that knowledge is way more important than anything else. And if they happen to be 20, 30, or 40 years older than you, so what? My husband isn't a millionaire, of course, but he makes good money and he for sure is a high-value man that will take care of me in many ways and I will do the same for him. This was something I could only dream of. Good for OP. She seems lovely. I hope that everything worked out. Am I the jerk for leaving without explanation after mother-in-law pretended not to hear me? I, 32 female, have a 7-month-old daughter with my husband who's 34. My country does ensure a long maternity leave for up to 2 years. However, I'm self-employed and I cannot afford to lose my clients, so I try to work while my daughter is sleeping and during the weekends. Lately, she's been teething, so I'm operating on little to no sleep. I have an issue with my mother-in-law. She does what she wants, despite people asking her not to, and then says, oops, or denies it. Things like that. It was annoying before the baby, but after she was born, it's become insufferable. Husband talked to her and set boundaries, so she stopped doing that when my husband is present, but she was still doing it when it's only me in the room. So we agreed she cannot visit when husband is not at home, and husband is not to leave me alone with her. Because of these boundaries, we did not go see them for one and a half months. They lived two hours away, and we did not find a mutually good time. They finally came over last Sunday. 20 minutes into the visit, my father-in-law wants to see a lawnmower that is broken down, so my husband goes into the backyard with him, leaving me, the baby, and mother-in-law inside. She's drinking coffee and eating cake. She sits next to my daughter on her playmat and tries to feed her some of her cake. I immediately tell her, no, she can't have that. Mother-in-law pretends not to hear me and proceeds trying to feed her the cake. I repeat, stop doing that. She can't have cake yet and definitely not from your spoon. Still, she pretends not to hear me. I repeat again, still nothing and now there's cake on my baby's face and she's fussing. So I grab my daughter and I go to my husband and father-in-law, suddenly gesturing him to come back inside. After about five minutes, Mother-in-law decided to go outside too and was approaching me and the baby. I gestured to my husband again and he made an annoyed face. I had no energy to deal with any of this, so I stood up, went inside, grabbed baby bag and car keys and went to the car without saying a word. Mother-in-law asked me where I was going and I ignored her. I drove to my sister's, which is about a 15-minute drive. There were some missed calls from my husband, so I texted him where we were and that we'll be back in the evening. It was time for my daughter's nap and she fell asleep, so my sister told me to go to sleep too. After she woke up and had her milk, my sister took her and told me to go back to sleep. I slept three hours in total and my phone was on silent, so my husband's calls were ignored and apparently his parents left disappointed and mother-in-law cried. My husband is furious I did this. We're still fighting about it. He can't believe I was so rude and took the baby away when his parents came to see her after such a long time. He's angry I couldn't have waited a few minutes so that he could finish talking about the lawnmower. I told him I'm too exhausted to deal with this crap. He left me alone with mother-in-law despite our agreement, even though it was only 10 minutes. So I left. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Your mother-in-law should respect your boundaries and especially when it's about your baby. And your husband should have had your back on that. 
I do understand that it must be uncomfortable and hurt him, seeing his mother cry and be upset, but then he should talk to her about it instead of making you the bad person. The only thing I think you did wrong was that you didn't pick your daughter up after the first time you said it and mother-in-law didn't listen. Maybe that would have made things more smooth, but then again, it shouldn't really be necessary. I do think that it's important that you stand up for your boundaries and your husband should support you on that. Not the jerk, but you have a husband problem as much as a mother-in-law problem. So mother-in-law was ignoring your instructions about your kid, so you went to your husband so he could deal with his mother. Except a lawnmower, which would still be there after the conversation with you finished, was more important than his agitated wife and child. And instead of checking if you were okay, he had a go at you for making his mother cry. You need to have a serious talk with your husband about how much he is actually supporting you with your kid and with his mother. When you have that conversation, do not let him distract you with, but they were upset. Mother-in-law behaved inappropriately. He ignored you, so you left. Their behavior created the issue. You let him know where you were and when you'd be back. Do not let him turn any of this back onto you. He and his mother have a lot to apologize for. Karen demands to live with me. I put her in the attic. I own a bungalow in an area near the university my sister attends. She's having some housing issues. She's looking into her options, but everything has fallen through or comes with issues so far. She's asked me if she could stay with me until she graduates. She would be moving in June this year and moving out May of 2022. She has said she'll pay 50-50 for everything in this time if I agree. ETA, 50-50 in the case is 400 pounds per month, which is meant to cover food and bills. I am paying the mortgage separately and out of my own money. I'm hesitant about this, as while we haven't shared a roof in a few years, when we did live together, we drove each other up the wall. My bungalow is two floors. There's the main floor, which has two bedrooms, a living room, a kitchen, and bathroom, and there's a staircase that leads to a converted attic, which has a bedroom, kitchenette, and in-suite. The key differences are that while the kitchen has all the normal kitchen things, oven, counters, dishwasher, the kitchenette is a table and a shelf with a microwave, kettle, small fridge, and some basic kitchen storage, and the bathroom has a bath slash shower, while the in-suite has just a small shower, and in general, the attic is far smaller than the main floor, with sloped walls due to the roof shape that means the area you can actually stand in works out to about half the space the main floor has. Also worth pointing out that the stairs to the attic are in the middle of the main floor, and it's an actual staircase that leads into the attic. There's no door. I told my sister that if we're doing this, she's taking the attic. I said that she can use the bathroom and kitchen because I do appreciate that the kitchenette and in-suite leave a lot to be desired. But I expect to get priority for the kitchen and bathroom because she'll have the kitchenette and in-suite entirely to herself. And other than that, the attic is her space. I said I couldn't offer her the second bedroom because I have an office in there and it would disrupt me to move it. She responded that I'm the worst, that the attic room sucks because it's tiny, that the in-suite and kitchenette are crap, and that her area wouldn't even have a door. She says that the attic isn't worth paying 50% of everything, that she should get the second bedroom and I could move my office up to the attic, or into my room, or into the living room, as my office is pretty much just a desk and chair, so it would take me five minutes to shift it completely and wouldn't take up much space. I said she's the one who wants to move into my place, and I want boundaries around this stuff, and confining her to the attic seems like the best way to do that. She called me a jerk and said if I don't want her to live with me, then I just had to say so. I said that's not what this is. I don't mind her living with me. I just want some boundaries. But she called me a jerk and is now ignoring my texts. Am I the jerk? Well, who do you agree with? OP or her sister? Please let us know. That attic sounds kind of nice to be honest. Ours is much scarier. Am I the jerk for bringing my eight kids to a park with all elderly people and disturbing the peace? So I, 37 female, and my husband, 36 male, have eight kids, ages 3 to 13. All of them are adopted, which is kind of important later. We RV full-time in our travel trailer. So far, it's been amazing, and we've had so many amazing experiences. Also important to mention, my husband and oldest daughter are deaf. So are most of my kids, but it's not very important to this story. Anyways, a few days ago, we wanted to go to a town, but there was only really one thing we wanted to see, so we decided we would get to the RV park in the afternoon on Friday, and the kids would finish school, and we would spend the night there, and then on Saturday morning, we would pack up the RV, go to the thing we wanted to see, and then from there, go to a different state, where we are staying for a week. So when we arrived on Friday, 
we started getting the RV unpacked. There were little tables with picnic benches outside of each RV, and at the lot in front of us, there was an elderly man sitting at the picnic tables. My kids are very well behaved and know that they shouldn't be very loud, especially when we're in a park where the RVs are very close together. But the second we got out of the car, the old man was just staring at us. We get stares a lot, but it was more angry than confused. He said, Hey lady, are those all yours? To me. I just said yes. Then he said, Well, they better not be too loud. Those weren't his exact words, because what he really said wasn't so nice. I rolled my eyes and just kind of walked away, thinking I wouldn't have to interact with him much. We finished school and ate dinner. Then around 6.30, I was helping my 3- and 5-year-old get ready for bed. My other kids were just cleaning up the outside table from dinner when my 7-year-old fell and scraped her knee. She started crying, as most 7-year-olds would. My 13-year-old went over to help her. Then the man, who I guess was still sitting outside, started yelling at my 13-year-old to make my 7-year-old shut up. My 13-year-old obviously couldn't hear him, as I said earlier, but I guess he thought she was ignoring him. Then, my husband went out to help my 7-year-old and the man started screaming at him to control his kids. My husband signed that he didn't understand what he was saying and the man called my husband a mean name. I heard that and ran out. I began arguing with the guy who said I was a terrible mother for bringing my litter of kids to a campsite with all elderly people. 1. I didn't know all elderly people were going to be there. And two, other than my seven-year-old crying, they really weren't being noisy. I'm pretty sure he lived at the site full time. Anyways, the next morning as we were leaving, I saw him talking with some other elderly people from the site and they were giving us the stink eye as we were leaving. I kind of feel like a jerk for maybe not reading up on the site before we went. We usually skim the website, but since we were only going for the night, it didn't feel necessary. Am I the jerk here? Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Now might not be the best time to be traveling with your eight kids around the country. But hey, do you. Entitled mom is going to be a grandma and it's all about her. I, 33 female, am currently 38 weeks pregnant expecting my first, a girl. It's been a roller coaster of a year for us. We were supposed to get married July 2020 but canceled due to lockdown in April. Once we realized that we would have to postpone the wedding, we decided to start trying for a baby since neither of us are getting any younger. My husband is 36. Lo and behold, it worked right away. We shared the news with our parents when we were about 9 weeks along. My in-laws already have 3 grandkids, but this would be their first grandkid on my parents' side. My mom lives on the other side of the country and she lost it during the video chat we had with how excited she was to be a grandma. It was sweet. She said she was definitely coming to visit when the baby was born. Since then, we actually did have a small backyard wedding, socially distanced. We bought our first house and moved, and are now waiting anxiously for the baby to arrive. It's been a stressful and overwhelming year, and my mom has only added to that. When we bought the house and hadn't even moved in yet, it started with dictating what type of mattress and bed we needed to buy for the guest room to make her stay with us comfortable. While we are still trying to figure out closing logistics and moving while both working from home full time, she's calling us multiple times to make sure we buy her a queen bed and a mattress that's not too firm but not too soft and not too hot. Her weekly calls would also involve her asking how much weight I've gained each week in my pregnancy and warning me each time that I should try not to gain too much because I would eventually have to lose it. As the baby's arrival draws closer, she is making me more and more anxious about her visit. She booked her flight for two days before my due date to stay for three weeks. She didn't ask which dates would be good for us before she booked it. I wanted to make sure she was planning to come and help us and not just be a house guest that would hog the baby cuddles. I said to her in one call, I hope you don't mind making us a few meals while you're here to help us out. Her response was, Well, I'm not coming to be your maid. Now that the second wave of lockdown has really hit our country, we decided that it would be best that she quarantine for a week in an Airbnb when she arrives before coming to our house. She agreed. It gave me a huge relief to know that I will hopefully have at least one to two weeks with the baby, hopefully, and my husband before she descends on us. Then she says, if the baby comes early, she will bump up her flight. She keeps saying she can't wait to meet her baby. The icing on the cake is that I got a text from her a few days ago asking us if we were able to accommodate her new keto diet while she is here. I'm hoping the baby comes early and she doesn't change her flight so that we can have more time to adjust before we have to cater to her. On top of being a first-time mom, 
Giving birth during lockdown and not knowing what the first few days and weeks of newborn care will be like, I'm having a really hard time and don't know how to deal with my mom. ETA I forgot to mention that she expects us to stock her Airbnb with groceries before she arrives and will be sending us a list. I told her she could arrange grocery delivery, but she says she will need them there to have dinner right away when she arrives in the afternoon. My husband and I are not even going to the grocery store ourselves and are having our groceries delivered to avoid catching anything before I give birth. Update. I had a long talk with my super supportive husband and he could see how much it was affecting me. He made me sit down to practice a conversation with her and then we called her together. The goal of the call was to set some boundaries and expectations. We indicated to her that we wanted to be on the same page with her so no one is disappointed or overwhelmed during her visit. I said that especially in the first couple of weeks, we would want to have as much time to bond the two of us with our baby and will want to have the most time with her. Well, firstly she asked why we need to talk about boundaries and then she said, Maybe I just shouldn't come if I would be intruding. My husband said, that's not what we're saying. But why don't you tell us what your expectations are for the visit? She said she pictured us being tired and overwhelmed, so she would take the baby while we nap or take a walk. I said that's very possible, but we will probably be feeding her and such, and the support we need from you will be more so supporting us so we can take care of her instead of you taking care of her. She repeated that she wouldn't be a maid. I told her that we had no expectations of her being a maid, but part of supporting us would entail doing some household chores. She ended up telling us that it sounded like she would be intruding and that we can let her know in a month or two when we were ready for a visit. Then she said, take care of yourself, and we ended the call. I am relieved that we have more control over when she comes and can wait until we are adjusted. I also feel insanely guilty because I know she's upset and I did not expect her to just cancel her trip when we try to set boundaries. In any case, I think it's for the best and I appreciate everyone's advice. Now, I just gotta get rid of the guilty feeling and focus on my new daughter's arrival. Well, what would you have done in this situation? Would you have wanted grandma to come for a visit or not? Please let us know. No. Next. Am I the jerk for abandoning my roommate and possibly leaving him houseless? I, 21, female, live with my best friend, 21, male, Dan. We've been friends for three years and moved in together about a year and a half ago. It was okay for a bit, but it's gone to crap. I keep up on chores while also cleaning up after myself. Dan does not. He's inconsistent with chores, rarely vacuums, never sweeps, doesn't keep up on his dishes, cleans his cat's litter box twice a month. This is an issue as the washer and dryer are in his bathroom. There's often litter and sometimes feces on the ground from one of the cats kicking it out. We have three cats. I've talked to him and even started a chore chart, but it was forgotten and nothing changed. I've started to feel used. Dan depends on me, cleaning the house, taking care of his diabetic cat, putting his new car on the lease. Three weeks ago, I told him I was no longer taking care of him. I told him we needed to split ways after the lease ended, November 2021, as I felt our friendship was suffering. Two weeks ago, he was house-sitting and asked me to get the mail because he had a package. I was on my way home from work and it was pouring when he asked. I hate the trek to the mailbox, especially in the rain. I decided to do it the next day, but my mental health got bad and I couldn't get out of bed. At 9 p.m., I texted him and apologized for not getting the mail. He seemed upset and said he needs the mail and he can't get it until 11 p.m. when he's off work. I snapped. I felt like I was being guilted. I know we both need to check the mail, but this was the final straw. I told him it wasn't my responsibility and it ended with me telling him I wanted to move out ASAP and not be friends. He was fine with it and refused to talk to me. He told me he'd be moving in with a friend and I started to figure out things on my end. I talked to my leasing office and got on a list to get a one bedroom unit. I checked with Dan two separate times about moving. He told me that his plans were solid and he was adamant about not finishing the lease. I found out I could get my apartment by the end of this month and asked Dan if this would work for him. He said yes. The next morning, he came to me to talk. He wanted to fix our friendship and stay till the end of the lease. This was a complete 180 from what he said before. He told me the person he was moving in with could only let him stay until May because she's selling her house and said he didn't have anywhere to go after that. I held firm on moving out, but said I was open to fixing our friendship. I told him he could get on a list for a one bedroom apartment in the complex and stay with the friend until then. I emphasize that I need this for my own sake. When I talked to my girlfriend about this, she made me feel like I was a jerk for abandoning my friend and essentially leaving him houseless. 
I feel conflicted because I care about Dan, but I think it's time for him to grow up. I also feel he was disingenuous about wanting to fix our friendship and only wanted to do so because his plans fell through. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk or is Dan? Please let us know. I don't think I'd want Dan living with me, to be honest. He sounds worse than you, Mr. Reddit. Next week, I'm going to fire you. Worked for a crappy airline company. Let's just make up a name. United Blair Lines. At this company, they started a smaller company that could hire and train people to run planes, but pay them way less at certain airports. Where my colleagues at other airports were making over $20 an hour, I was getting paid $10.25 for the same and sometimes more work. It honestly would scare you to know how little the people who are the ones that make sure your planes take off safely are paid. All of us had two to three jobs to be able to pay rent and we were all in the job for the benefits. Free flights to anywhere in the country, on standby. Anyway, I had a boss, we'll call him Jim. I could tell many stories on how terrible of a boss he was, but this one has actual malicious compliance. I had to go to the hospital from the airport because of intense pain in my stomach. It turns out that because of stress caused by that job, my intestines decided to stop functioning. Anyway, I spend the day in the hospital and then they gave me a note saying that I didn't have to work the next two days. I told Jim's boss that since I hated talking to Jim. When I went back into work three days later, we had five people total to load all luggage, load the water, and push out five planes in a little over an hour. Already an incredible amount of work for so few people. We had our morning work meeting to discuss how swamped we were. Then Jim asked me into his office. Your attendance is unacceptable, he said. Dumbfounded, I asked him what he meant. You've been late a couple of times and now missing the past three days. I said, Jim, I have a note from the hospital. According to work policy, that shouldn't affect my attendance. I don't care what work policy says. I'm going to fire you. Again, I cited work policy since we were protected by a union. I said, Jim, you have to give me an attendance warning before you're allowed to fire me for attendance. This is the first time I'm hearing about attendance, so you can't fire me right now. Jim said, It doesn't matter. I'm going to give you a warning right now, and when I get back from vacation next week, you're going to be fired. Now go back to work. My decision is final. So I told my coworkers what happened. Then I decided, all right, well, if next week he's firing me, I'll just leave now. Even though their day was about to be swamped, since now four people were working five planes, they all said, forget this place, get out of here. So I left and went to get breakfast. This all happened at 4 a.m. As I'm enjoying my meal, Jim calls me. I happily ignore. He calls three more times and then texts me asking where I was at. I told him, you fired me. Why would I keep working for you? No response. I try to soak in the sight of Jim running between planes like a chicken. I don't imagine any plane took off on time that morning. I get a call from HR and the union rep and the general manager, who is Jim's boss. They all said Jim was wrong and asked me if I could come back to work it out. But quitting felt so good and I felt such weight lifted off my shoulders thinking about not working there anymore. So I never went back. Some more info. Although this isn't so satisfying, it's more a testament of United Blair Line's complete lack of ethics. Jim got in really big trouble when he had a guy who had a shoulder injury and had a note and told Jim several times he couldn't do super heavy labor. Jim sent him to the bag room by himself anyway. Imagine having to lift 300 to 700, 50 to 70 pound bags over your head per hour all while running between bag carts and the belt. Needless to say, the guy tore his shoulder and had to get surgery on it. They still didn't fire Jim. Instead, they promoted him to manage the workers who did ticketing and no manual labor. As far as I know, Jim still works for United. My coworkers still cannot move the way he used to two years later. Karma will get you, Karen. There was a point in time, years ago, where I worked in a supermarket. I will not go into details about what it was like working for this particular supermarket, but when three separate staff members were under so much stress that, well, they thought of doing something not so nice, you can imagine how toxic it was. The fact that I managed to last two and a half years was extraordinary. <laughs> anyway, I was pretty much the assistant store manager in everything but job title and pay rate. I had a store manager who was so lazy that I did most of his work for him. He also liked to clock out earlier than he should, just so he could beat the traffic to get home. Remember this fact for later. It was my day off, but I had to come in to do an emergency order. 
one of our freezer units had broken down and I needed to reorder all the spoiled stock. I had done the order and then decided to head up the road to a fast food establishment where the burgers are better. I was dressed in just a plain black polo shirt and black denim jeans, nothing special. The uniform for this fast food establishment was a red shirt and black pants. I had placed my order and sat down at a nearby table while I waited for them to prepare it. There were about three other people waiting for orders and about three people waiting in line to order. Then in walks Karen. She sees the line and waits very impatiently. After about a minute, she spies me and comes over to me. Karen, why are you not up there taking orders? Me, excuse me? Why are you not taking orders? You shouldn't be sitting around like this. Me, um, I don't work here. B.S. I see you here all the time. Now get up there and take my order. Me. But like I said, I do not work here. You're just being lazy. You just don't want to work. Me. I... I don't want to work? Exactly. And with that attitude, you will never be any more than a fast food employee. Me. Look, this is my day off. And like I said, I do not work here. At that moment, my order is ready. So I get up and grab my order. Karen follows right behind me. So now you're going to take even longer to take my order? This is ridiculous. Me. Look, if you want to place an order, there is no line right now. I don't care if there is a line or not. I want you to do my order or I will get you fired. Me. Look, I told you I do not work here. I told you it's my day off. I told you there's no line. Now I'm leaving with my food to enjoy it somewhere away from a rude, obnoxious person like you. Karen, how dare you call me obnoxious? Karen proceeds to grab my drink and tip it over me and the floor. The manager comes out and asks what's happening. I tell him my side of the story. Karen tells him her side of the story. The manager replaces my drink, gives me a large fry for free and allows me to leave while he talks to Karen. I decide to go back down to work and use the staff room to eat my lunch. While there, I get a phone call from the store manager. Manager, hey OP, are you still in the city? Me. Yes, why? Well, I left early and I am nearly home now. I just remembered that I had a job interview lined up for this afternoon. Me. And? Well, you have experience with job interviews. Can you do it for me? Me. Okay, when is the interview? She should be there in a couple of minutes. It's for a cashier role, so you know what to ask. Me. Yep, okay. I go to the front counter and tell the girls to send the person for the interview down to the store manager's office when she gets here. I finish up my lunch and wait. There's a knock on the door and the door opens and it's Karen, here for a job interview. The first words out of her mouth were, I'm not going to get this job, am I? And I just shook my head. Don't want me to fix the servers? Fine. Background. Sometime around 2000, I worked for a major finance slash brokerage company in the IT department. I worked the overnight shift alone and, among other things, my responsibilities included monitoring of the company's most important servers, including the trading servers, as well as performing almost all repairs on these servers since my shift was the least impactful on business. These servers were how every trade from every broker worldwide was processed on behalf of clients. We had eight servers all behind a load director. For those non-IT people, think traffic at an intersection with a cop letting vehicles know which way they can go. At the time, I reported directly to one of the assistant vice presidents for IT. Cast is simply me, Don, AVP, and Kathy, VP. So at some point, doing my job, I began to notice issues with our trading servers. I determined the cause, come up with a plan to repair the failing parts. On the first night of the week, I will take down two servers, repair them, bring them back up, and put them back behind the load director. I will repeat this for the next three nights, allowing all eight servers to be repaired with minimal impact and have the last night of the week in case anything goes the way of the toilet. Understand that while I had authority to do this with just about any of the other 1,000 servers the company had, I could not touch these without the Don's approval. So I sent an email to the Don detailing the problem, the parts I needed to order, the plan, etc. All I needed from her was a response that said, approved, and I would have everything completed within two weeks. Also note that I had red receipts turned on for all my emails. As you can probably guess, I heard nothing back. Two weeks later, I follow up with another email, reminding her of the issue and including all the documentation I had sent with the first one. Nothing. 
Another two weeks go by and I send a second follow-up email, noting that this isn't a question of if these machines will fail, but only a matter of when. Crickets. Another two weeks go by. It's now about noon on Friday and I'm home having just begun my weekend. I get a call that goes something like this. Me. Hello? Kathy. Is this Morpheus J? Me. Yes. This is Kathy. Who? When I'm off the clock, that part of my brain turns off. It's Kathy, your boss. Me. Oh, hey, you, Kathy. What's... Oh, this cannot be good. I'm now realizing that my boss's boss is calling me at my house and that all the excrement must have followed an upward trajectory towards the device circulating air. Kathy. All the trading servers have crashed. We need everyone on hand. Me. I'll be there in 20 minutes. It was usually a 35-minute drive. Basically, one server crashed and the load from that server was transferred to the remaining seven, which caused number two to fail under the increased load. Rinse and repeat for all eight servers. I arrived at work to find the entire team is there with eight brand new servers ready to be built. We get everything built, locked down, restored from latest backups, and online again by 6 p.m., then home for the weekend. I get to work Sunday night, my Monday, and the first thing I do is print out emails and those oh-so-precious red receipts. I place them in a nice folder on the corner of my desk. At 7 a.m. Monday morning, end of my shift, Kathy walks into my office and asks me to join her in her office. I say sure and grab the folder and follow her. When we get to her office, present are me, Kathy, Don, and a lady from HR. Kathy. So, Morpheus J, I understand from Don that it is your job to monitor the trading servers can you tell me what happened? Me. Sure. Opens folder. As you can see from this email, from this date, highlighted for your convenience. I notified Don of the problem and requested approval to go ahead with the fix. Here. Opens folder again. Is the red receipt showing she read it the following morning at this time. Again, highlighted for your convenience. Rinse and repeat for the other emails. Kathy. Okay. Thank you, Morpheus J. Have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Fallout. The company lost a stupid amount of money making good on every single trade that didn't happen due to the crash. I come back to work that night to find out from the team that Dawn was gone. I never told them the details. I was assigned to the backup contingency planning team and later to the team that implemented the BCP so that nothing like this would ever happen again. We got a new AVP. Not allowed in the bakery I work in. I'm 18 and have worked in my hometown bakery slash shop since I was 16. It's a cute little town where everyone practically knows everyone and there are mostly sweet old men and ladies walking their dogs or kids running around to collect stickers from the local library. I've lived here my whole life and though I'm looking at moving for university this year, it's still a wholesome little town. Anyway, this takes place during the lockdown but shortly after the first initial lockdown in England. We are considered an essential business because we sell milk and bread, as well as flour at the time. We have to wear masks at our jobs and advise other customers to wear masks too, though we're not supposed to tell them specifically to wear one. I still wasn't back at college for the time, so was asked to help out a few hours here and there with my boss and coworker because one employee was still furloughed for the time being. I had to say yes and got a little extra money under my belt. However, because of our low stock at the big bakery, which supplied all of our food to cook and bread to sell, we didn't get a lot of sandwich fillings and often had to go to the local shop right next door in order to pick up extra butter, lettuce, etc. This one fateful day, we had run out of butter as we recently started remaking bacon baps in the morning and the builders were coming in herds. So my boss asked me to take a few pounds out of the till, go get some butter, then get the receipt, yada yada. I was used to doing this and didn't complain. I took my work apron off and threw my jacket on because man, it was freezing. Got the butter, moving on. As I go to walk back into the bakery, this woman sticks out her foot by the door and stops me. I'm silently praying it's not a Karen and luckily it isn't, but she's not far off. Lady, ahem, me, yes, lady, it's two customers at a time and I was here first. <laughs> For work, we have to wear black trousers and a black button-up. Because we're on our feet all day, all of us wear leggings and trainers. Paired with my hoodie, I did not look like I worked there, so I understood the confusion. Me. I know it's two people at a time. I'm just trying to- I was here first! I try going around her again and she moves closer to the door. 
I have really bad anxiety, and lockdown has made me really paranoid about people being near me I don't know. So to keep myself from panicking, and to keep her unmasked self away from me, I stepped back. My boss hadn't noticed us, as she didn't know I was back from the shops, and was busy serving this mom and her screaming kid, as well as a builder. I gave up by this point, as the second person left, I quickly darted in and sorted my apron out again, just in time to see the lady walk in, ready to throw hands. My boss had gone to doing paperwork as there were only us two and there was a lot to do. I smirked under my mask. Me, rather sweetly. Hello, how can I help you today? The lady stands there for a moment, almost dumbfounded. And you guessed it, she wasn't wearing a mask. I knew she was about to throw a tantrum, so I made things even better. Me, boss, did you want me to deliver a customer's bread on the way home from work? My boss responds with a hearty, yes please, and I turn back to finish serving the lady who leaves without so much as a word. Despite 9 out of 10 of our customers being jerks, that was a good day to work in retail. I told my boss the story, and we had a small laugh. She did wonder why I was standing outside with some butter. Karen keeps insisting that I'm hitting on her. She gets banned. I, 24 female, live with my good friend, 25 male. I own the apartment. I'm renting out the extra room to him. A little over a month ago, he met a girl online and they started dating. She's now at her place constantly. I'll be honest, I've never really liked her. She was incredibly standoffish and rude to me from the beginning. I eventually learned it was because she thought I had a thing for my roommate, even after he told her I wasn't straight. A few weeks ago, we were all drinking and hanging out at our place with a few close friends. I tried to mend fences by pulling the girlfriend aside and telling her that I really am not straight and I have no interest in stealing her boyfriend and I hope we can be friends. She seemed to take this very well and was overly friendly with me the whole rest of the night. I thought she was just trying to make up for being so cruel at first. The next day, my roommate asked if we could talk. He said his girlfriend feels uncomfortable around me after I drunkenly hit on her. What? I was not even remotely close to being drunk. Also, I am negatively attracted to her, like way less than zero. I find her insanely annoying. I tried to explain that I was trying to be nice as I knew she didn't particularly like me. I wanted to be civil if she was going to be around more often. My roommate seemed skeptical, but he ultimately took my word for it and chalked it up to a miscommunication. Fast forward a week or so, the friend group is hanging out at our place again. The girlfriend comes over, of course. I'm cordial to her, but I try to keep my distance so another miscommunication doesn't happen. Towards the end of the night, one of our other friends comes up to me like, dude, what's going on? Girlfriend keeps telling everyone you've been checking her out and hitting on her all night. Again, I was stunned, and at this point, incredibly upset. I went right up to the girlfriend in front of everyone and said, What the heck's going on? Why are you spewing lies about me hitting on you to all of my friends? She just stared at me, unable to respond. I continued, Just because I'm gay doesn't mean I'm into you. Trust me, I'm not the least bit interested in you. She started sobbing that I was attacking her for no reason calling her out, making her super uncomfortable again, etc. I told her to get the heck out and that she was no longer welcome here for making me feel uncomfortable in my own apartment. Her and her roommate left. Needless to say, my roommate is super upset with me. He hasn't been back to our place since, but I've gotten some angry texts. I'm standing my ground that she is not welcome here anymore, but he is free to stay or move out as he pleases. Most of our friends are on my side. I guess I could have been easier on her, but I'm just so over it. Edit. I guess I should have added that where I live, the mask slash stay at home mandates have been lifted for a while. That being said, my friends and I still choose to wear masks and be extremely careful. We do not go out to bars, even though they are fully open. I occasionally have a few close friends over whom I trust to also be careful. No parties. I don't get how anyone landed on that. Hope this clears things up. Well, what would you do in this situation? What if you had a Karen who said you kept hitting on her? Please let us know. I'd tell her, in your dreams, Karen. In your dreams. Don't want 60 seconds of adjustment? Okay, enjoy waiting six weeks. So I'm a dental assistant for a private practice. Let me just preface this by saying most of our patients are wonderful people. Friendly, happy to see us, respectful of our professional opinions and recommendations, etc. But literally, just like three hours ago, I had the biggest Karen in for what should have been a simple appointment. So when we do crowns, or caps as some people know them as, we prep the tooth beforehand and take an impression. 
Then that impression goes to a lab and the techs down there make the crown. It takes two to three weeks for them to send the crown back. When we deliver the crown to the patient, the doctor and I try the crown in first to see how it fits. It is very rare that it fits perfectly. We almost always have to make some adjustments, shaving down the crown here and there, checking the space in between the teeth, checking the bite, etc. All of this is standard. The main thing we use is called articulating paper. When the patient bites down on it, we can see heavy blue markings where the bite needs adjusting. The more we adjust, the lighter those marks get and even stop marking altogether sometimes. Most exchanges with the patient are like this. How's it feel? It's a little high. Okay, we'll adjust that. We use the articulating paper, then grind the crown down a little. How's it feel now? Oh, it feels much better. Okay, cool, let's cement it in. This takes maybe five minutes at most. This lady we had tonight was having none of it. Us, how's it feel? Karen, ah, it's way off. Us, okay, we'll adjust it. How's it feel now? The same. Us, um, really, no change? The same. Us, okay, no biggie, let's adjust more. We did this maybe for five minutes, over and over, and she kept insisting that it was exactly the same, no change. Even though the marks were gone at this point, meaning that her teeth were no longer even touching the crown. At this point, we had a couple options which the doctor presented to her. Doc, okay, well, I can keep adjusting the crown. The only issue is that if I keep reducing the porcelain on top, the metal underneath might end up showing. Are you okay with that? Karen, no. Doc, okay, well then I need to make a small adjustment to the tooth above this one so that they don't touch. It's very superficial. No. Don't touch my upper teeth. Doc, we do this all the time, ma'am. It doesn't harm the teeth. We're basically just polishing it. No, that's a lie. If you guys did it correctly the first time, you wouldn't have to adjust it at all. Me, ma'am, we do this for everyone. The lab almost never makes them perfect. We either have to adjust the crown itself or the opposing teeth. Karen, no, you messed up. Me, well, we have to adjust one or the other. So which would you prefer? Do you want metal showing? No. Me. So we can polish the opposing tooth? No. It'll literally take a few seconds. No, you're lying. It's going to harm my teeth. At this point, the doctor suggested getting our office manager to talk to Karen. Our office manager is an awesome lady. She's old, doesn't give a hoot, and is two years away from retirement. I told her the situation, and she laughed and said, Okay, let's make her wait another month. I don't give a hoot. So she marched right in there and said, Okay, ma'am, since you don't want this crown, we'll send it back to the lab and have them redo it. So instead of just waiting the 60 seconds for us to adjust, she now has to wait three weeks to come in again. And that's just to re-prep the tooth. Then she has to wait another three weeks for the crown to come back from the lab again. Anyways, thanks for reading. I mostly just wanted to type this out to rant. I've been working as a dental assistant for almost a decade now, and I've never had an exchange like that. It was so bizarre. I straight up think she was either lying to our faces or just crazy. It made zero sense. Edit. To the people saying she has every right to request the crown to be redone, no duh. That's not my issue. My issue is that she accused us of lying, screamed at us, wouldn't tell us why it felt exactly the same, and didn't want any solutions we offered. I've had many patients request crowns to be redone. Not a problem. Sometimes the color is off. Sometimes the fit is really wrong. They just weren't total Karens about it. You can be polite and still get your way. Speaking of the dentist, when was the last time you went to the dentist and what did they do? Please let us know. Probably 2009-ish. I should really get a checkup or something. Am I the jerk for picking my dog over my pregnant sister? Last year, my female 32, sister, female 28, was kicked out of her boyfriend's house and I took her in. We don't have the best relationship, but she was jobless and I was the only relative still living in our country. Surprise, surprise, about two months later, she figured out she was pregnant. One day, she started to complain about my dog, a beautiful two and a half year old husky, and how it would be bad for her baby and that she wouldn't raise her kid with a wild animal around. My dog is a total sweetheart. I told her it was my house and if she was not comfortable here, she could leave and my dog was staying no matter what. She kept complaining, but I wouldn't change my mind. 
About two weeks ago, I had to travel for work to a remote location for a few days. When I came back, my dog was not home and my sister claimed she had no idea where it was. We got into a fight because I didn't believe her. I ended up storming off and asked a few neighbors if they had seen it. One told me the last time he saw it was when my sister took him somewhere a few days ago. She uses my Uber account because she's broke, so when I found an odd trip to the other side of the city, I connected the dots. I drove all the way over there and after asking around, I found my dog in a street restaurant. The owner took him after a blonde pregnant woman left him leashed to a fence. I ended up explaining the situation, paying him like 500 bucks and I got my dog back. When I went back home, I kicked out my sister. I gave her enough money for a week in a hotel and sent her on her merry way. She made a huge scandal and I admit I was a bit too forceful but I was furious. She called all my family and friends and they're all telling me I'm a jerk for picking my dog over my sister and that I should take her back, that I should value that unborn baby more than a silly animal. I think my dog is more important and what my sister did is unforgivable, but I'll accept your judgment. Update. I'll try to answer some questions, but I can't read all the comments. I'm sorry if I missed something. 1. I left my dog with my sister because I never thought she would do something like this. She was complaining and that should have been a huge red flag, but she complains about many things and never does anything else. I just thought it was something she'd forget about in a few weeks. I didn't leave her in charge of my pet in the sense that she didn't need to do anything for it. I have an automatic feeder and my backyard is big enough for it to go without walkies for a few days. 2. I live in a country where animal protection laws are almost non-existent. It would have been a hassle to get my lawyer to convince the police to get involved. Blame me for not using the proper legal channels, but I just wanted my dog back as soon as possible. I was really lucky my sister was dumb enough to take an Uber or I probably would have never found my dog. The easiest thing was to pay the guy who found him. I'm going to sound like a jerk for this, but in that part of town, people don't take animals for the goodness of their hearts. I was lucky I could convince the guy to let me buy it back. 3. About the bit too forceful part, I mean I was furious and screamed like a madwoman. She was hysterical too. The neighbors got involved and supported me and I ended up throwing her the money for the hotel through the taxi window. I'm pretty sure I scared the heck out of the driver. I gave her money because even if I was mad, it felt wrong to throw someone pregnant to the streets with only her clothes and cell phone. At least the money would be enough for her not to starve for a few days until she gets help from someone else. 5. She's not ever living with me again. I'm going no contact with everyone who sided with her. Yes, I explained my point of view, but I come from a very conservative family that values human life above all. I've been drilled this in my head my whole life, so it was hard to know if I was making the right choice, which now seems obvious. 6. I don't really know why she broke things off with her boyfriend. The story changes a lot. But I'll tell you, they met when she came to visit me a few years ago and she ended up moving in with him all in the same month. 7. The arrangement was that she could live with me until lockdown is over. No one would hire a pregnant woman. Plus, she works in tourism, which is a dead field right now. 2 Karen Stories for One Family So over the last week, my husband and I have both had to deal with some obnoxious Karens. My husband's experience happened first over the weekend. My husband works for a contractor's company and was working at a local large hospital for some renovations and upgrades. He was in the cafeteria waiting for two other guys so they could get to work and was very clearly wearing his company shirt that in large white letters says the company's name and wearing a badge with his face and company name and had tools on a tool belt. We've got my husband and Karen. I wasn't there, so this is how my husband told me it happened, which was backed by his two co-workers who came in when it got good. Karen, excuse me, I want someone to go get me food from this chicken place. Husband, sorry, I don't think they have that here. He goes back to playing a game on his phone or something. All he remembers as he went back to his phone. So, aren't you going to go get it? Husband, um, no, I'm waiting for my guys to start work. Karen shoves her leg into my husband's face. I'm a patient here and you have to take care of me. I want food from that place and find someone competent enough to know to put the band on my wrist, not leg. Husband, I don't work for the hospital. The registration desk is down the hall. Maybe they can help. My guys are here, so I'm going to start work. Have a nice day. She then grabbed his arm in full view of coworkers that had just come up. Karen, I know you work here. Now go get me food. Husband, ma'am, I don't work here. Please let go of me. 
My husband is careful not to jerk away in case she falls since it's a hospital. He made sure she was steady and pulled his arm away and started walking towards the elevators. Get back here and get me whoever is in charge of you to have you fired. Husband, I'm in charge of my guys today and we're leaving. It wasn't that exciting and he didn't see her for the rest of the day, but he got heck from his coworkers about it. Now my experience, which was yesterday, I work in an office building which shares about 20 separate offices with other companies. I have one near the end of the hall on the second floor by a door that's always locked. My coworker's office is down the hall, so my door is normally open for people coming to get checks or drop off contracts and checks. Further down the hall is a few other offices occupied, one of which is a place that orders lab tests to be sent to an independent lab. Earlier yesterday, I heard the owner of that office on the phone with someone yelling to calm down and be respectful or he wouldn't help her. I ignored most of it because it's not my business. Fast forward to yesterday afternoon and someone opened the door on the opposite end from me and started stomping down the hall. There are clear signs on the door and even arrows that point you to specific offices you need and the elevator has office numbers. Mine is 12 and the other one is 16 for instance. Stomping continues and some lady wearing no mask, coughing up a storm, barrels into my office, slamming the door back into the wall. I had it slightly closed. We've got me, we've got the owner, and we've got Karen. Karen. I have never been spoken to so rudely in my life. How dare you speak to me that way earlier? Keep in mind, the person she spoke to earlier was a guy with a deep voice in his 60s and I'm in my 20s and obviously pregnant. Me. Excuse me, ma'am. I'm going to need you to step out of my office and put on a mask and speak calmly or I will not help you. How dare you? I have respiratory issues and don't have to wear a mask. Me. That is all fine and good, but in my office you have to wear a mask for my and my child's protection or I will not help you. Either put on a mask or leave. I had no idea who she was yet and thought someone was mad at my company. Karen starts to come around my desk to come even closer to me and I grab the hand sanitizer, the closest thing. Me. If you come any closer, I will call the police and I will defend myself. Back up and put on a mask. Karen grumbles but takes steps back until she's in the doorway. You sent me to a place for testing that had a bunch of people in the waiting room and now I'm testing positive because you sent me there. What are you going to do for me? I demand a refund and for you to comp my next tests and visits. Okay, not my company, so I tell her. But who the heck comes into an office with no mask after testing positive? Me. You're in the wrong office. It's down the hall in Suite 16. I don't work. Yes, you do. I talked to you earlier, jerk. Me. No, you didn't. And I don't work for them. I work for XYZ Carpenter Office. Get out now before I call the police. I will tell them you caused me to get sick and have you arrested for endangerment. At that point, the owner of the company came back and came to hear what the commotion was about. She came up, heard the police bit, and decided to step in. Owner, excuse me, why are you harassing my employee? She yelled at me over the phone and made me get sick. Oh, you're sick and not wearing a mask to spread it to my employee and this entire building? You need to leave now or I will be calling the police. You wouldn't dare. Owner, OP, go ahead and call. I'll stay right here until they get here. I started typing the number into my phone and the lady ran down the hall and out of the door, told the other office about it, and they had all her information and will take care of it with a report. But seriously, now I'm in quarantine and so is my boss and I'm just hoping I don't have it. Am I the jerk for wanting a redo of my wedding that was ruined five years ago? I, 30 female, have been married to my husband, 32 male, for almost five years. Our fifth wedding anniversary is coming up in April and I suggested that we have a redo of our wedding because it was awful the first time around. Sister-in-law always had comments to make about the planning, my dress choice, food, etc. There were some members on my side who struggled with drinking and snuck in vodka and other drinks to my alcohol-free reception. Soon everyone was drinking, which, while I was upset, was willing to deal with it since it made them happy and have fun. However, things took a turn when the people didn't know when to stop. During pictures, my uncle threw up all on the main table where I, my husband, mother, father, mother-in-law, and father-in-law were to be seated. They had to clean the entire table, floor, and remake the table in time for dinner. We had to pay extra for the damage. There were also rude remarks from my husband's side. 
Shortly after the wedding, my husband and I took note of the ugliness that came from our families and slowly cut them out of our lives and or reduced contact. We moved in together shortly after, away from both families, and we've been happy ever since. We also both went into therapy since the wedding also brought out some of our negativity and unresolved mental health issues. Lockdown has been hard on us. We both work from home now, and I will admit that there have been a few moments where we both seemingly snap at each other for no reason, only to find out later it's a lot of built-up stress on our lives. We always talk it out, make up, and promise to do better for the sake of our marriage and each other. Last night, I brought up that I wanted a redo of our wedding. He asked why, and I reminded him of the things mentioned above, and more, and thought it would be nice to have a little ceremony in our yard that only consisted of a few friends and family. It isn't like we can have too many people anyway, due to what's going on. I still fit into my wedding dress, and though it'd be a nice way to relive our moment without so much toxicity from both sides. Also, my father is getting older, and probably doesn't have much time left on this planet. I want one of his final memories to be fun and beautiful without negativity. My husband exploded on me. Why do you want to waste money? He asked. He listed off things that would have made sense if we were tight on money, but we aren't. In fact, the lockdown has increased profits for my husband's business and we are very fortunate, grateful, and blessed. However, I was willing to listen to his reasons and compromise until he called me stupid for ever thinking about wanting a redo of something that was obviously going to be a disaster again. Am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OB or her husband? Please let us know. Maybe we should redo our wedding, Mr. Reddit. No thanks, Karen. I'd really rather not. Give me a slow laptop and blame me for taking too long? Fine. I was part of a technology pilot program which wanted every kid to have a laptop to accompany their schooling. My school, being in an affluent neighborhood, assumed that every student would bring their own half-decent laptop to class and said they would provide laptops to those that could not afford them. They were right to think that this would be a fairly small amount, at least initially. My parents were unable to buy a laptop after some troubling financial situations arose, so we asked the school to provide one. Oh boy, what a hunk of junk it was. The total polar opposite of the top-end fancy laptops available at the time. It had the computing power of synthetic peanut butter and had the resolution of a knockoff kaleidoscope. I had a lot of fun with that machine. Anyway, it was very, very slow in comparison to what my peers were using. The school, in their infinite wisdom, thought that the, not exaggerating here, I tested it, 10 times slower response time would not be an issue. I informed them that I would be at a significant disadvantage to the other students, but they brushed it off. I was near the top of my class, but not by so far I could just take a handicap like that. But alas, all the protest was in vain. Well, if they wanted it that way, that's what they were going to get. The first computer-based test, 30 minutes. My classmates finished after 15 to 20. Guess who was stuck there nearly an hour after my classmates? Yeah, that was fun. Somehow, this was my fault though. The teachers proctoring knew it wasn't. The IT department knew it wasn't. Yet, it was still my fault for being slow. I got reprimanded for that. So, come the next test, I asked to take the test on paper instead. The leader of the pilot program went on this long lecture about how the experience is different. First off, it's a math test. How much more different can it be? After another excruciatingly long testing period, the teacher slid me a copy of the paper test and said he'd overlook it for now, my favorite teacher by the way, and submit the test through his own account citing technology troubles. Lo and behold, it's literally no different from the test I was just taking. A few days after taking that second test, parents started complaining. Can you guess why? A student who gets good grades is allowed two times extra time? Yeah, that totally went over well. My grades actually didn't really improve much from that, but the point still stands. Those parents were so infuriated by the disparity in technology available, no doubt wanting their kids not to have anything except at least equal equipment to the others, and that I was getting some sort of advantage somehow, that they pushed for the school to enforce a minimum standard of laptop. Myself? I can't complain too much. I got a free, good laptop. Am I the jerk for choosing myself over my stepson? Title sounds bad, but wait till I explain, then you decide if I'm being selfish here. So I, 39, male, have been with my wife for three years. I have one biological daughter, age two, and I also have a stepson, age 19. 
Everything is fine, except for some issues, but nothing huge. My stepson is in college and he's struggling with transportation. He does not live with us, but he rents with a friend. He has issues with moving around and he claims public transportation is slow, costly, and not always available where he's staying. His mom always wants to help with this issue, but the money isn't enough. My stepson visited us several times to complain about the issue. Yesterday he visited and talked about needing a car ASAP and complained that he can't work without a car. My wife had a conversation with me later on and suggested that I pull out eight to nine thousand dollars from my savings and buy her son a car. Now I need to mention that I've been saving money for a partial knee replacement after I had an auto accident in 2017. My wife understood how much of a struggle this is and never mentioned the surgery money until now. I said I'm sorry but I can't. She looked dumbfounded like she didn't expect this response saying I've never really done anything for my stepson and it's just $8,000 and the surgery can be in May instead of March. She reminded me that children come first implying I was choosing myself and my health over my stepson. But my knee is damaged. I can't tell you. The pain is terrible. If it was up to me, I'd rather sit at home and rest, but I gotta go make a living. I have to. It's my duty as a father to provide for my kid, not a capable adult. Look, I understand he's struggling and I'm not trying to be mean, but that's not my problem. My wife said I was being negative, not acting like a parent and asked if my opinion would have changed if that was my biological son. So I'm expected to spend money on a car paid with money I worked so hard to get despite the pain I'm feeling just so my stepson's problem is fixed. I got mad and I left the room. Then she brought it up again, then again. I asked a friend about what I should do and he said, don't ruin your relationship with your stepson. But we're fine. I don't really understand what they mean by that. The issue is still here and I'm not sure because the surgery takes $27,000 and they say $8,000 won't make a difference, but I have to save up more money. Am I the jerk here or are they? Edit to answer some of your questions. A. Why can't he work and save up to buy a car? He says he can't get a job without getting a car first. B. How is he paying rent and school expenses when he doesn't work? Well, mommy sends money every month. C. Where's his dad in all of this? One word answer. Bailed. D. Why does he need an $8,000 car? I don't know. And to answer my own question of why I have to pay that much for a knee surgery, because America. Heck yeah. Also, commenter 130 is right. I do need a better friend. Well, what do you think? Should OP use his knee replacement surgery money that he's been saving up to buy his 19-year-old stepson an $8,000 car? Or not? Please let us know. I'd look into getting a new wife, to be honest. My entitled mother ruins my high school graduation. I graduated high school back in 2010, so I try to remember the best I can. I live in Texas, but lived across the border to Mexico, because to be honest, it's way cheaper to live over there when you're making money here in the US. My high school graduation was in the middle of June, which is the hottest days of the year. Imagine having to dress nicely for a graduation to be done in the middle of a football field on a scorching summer day. I had told my mom about this and she still wanted to bring my now four-year-old little brother to the graduation. Since I was busy with all of this, I told her to invite our family to this. This meant my uncles, aunts, and especially my grandparents. She said she did, but since I was busy with the whole graduation and enrolling into college, I believed her. The day came and she didn't tell a soul about my graduation. She just told me everybody was busy and to deal with it later. Since graduation was going to start in a few minutes, I just had to suck it up. Turns out she didn't tell anyone because she deemed this to be our family matters. After almost three hours in the heat, the graduation ended and my mother was nowhere to be seen. My friends were inviting me to their graduation parties and I wanted to get my mom's permission for this, so I called her. Me, hey mom, where are you? Entitled mom, oh, I went to get the car early so we can avoid traffic. Me, thinking this is perfect so I can tell her I'll go hang out with my friends at a graduation party so she can get back. No, you can't. We need to go back home since they are saying there's cartels fighting each other and it can get ugly and we need to get home and be safe. I told my friends about this and sadly I did not go to any graduation party. When I got into the car, I noticed that there's Chick-fil-A in there and I'm confused as to why it's there since we didn't get any on our way to my graduation. Oh, your brother was getting fussy because of the heat and hungry, so I took him to Chick-fil-A. I was mad, but maybe she went like after they called my name since they were going in alphabetical order and I was one of the first ones that got called. 
That way, she could get a picture of me being handed my diploma, and she said something that to this day, I hate her for it. We left 20 minutes after it started. OMG, did you seriously miss my graduation for this? Me, what the heck? At least did you bring me anything to eat? Entitled mom. No, here's some leftover chicken tenders from your brother. I assumed she was going to take me to a nice restaurant and I would meet my other family there. Nope, we went straight home and I didn't even eat dinner. I felt so ashamed and unappreciated that I just went to my room, closed my door, turned off my lights, and cried myself to sleep. Yes, I don't hate to admit it. I was an 18-year-old male that cried himself to sleep because his entitled mom made him feel like his life was not worth two craps, in her books or anybody else's in particular, and pushes me into a spiral of depression and self-loathing. Edit. For the record, my dad used to work in Ohio at that time of the year. Unfortunately, that's also the busiest and he couldn't come to my graduation. When I told him what my mom did, he was upset. So much that they were to the point of divorce, but luckily they didn't. My dad is very level-headed, unlike my mom. Oh, okay, I'll move the truck, mom. I am a 22-year-old female. I live with my parents, but I'm moving out in a couple of weeks, so my mother and I have been bumping heads a lot. The biggest thing we fight about is my clothes and my sleep. Recently, it's been more about my sleep than anything else. I go into work at 2 p.m. every day at my full-time job, so I'm there relatively late. When I get home, I like to decompress, play video games, watch TV, work out, and make something light to eat. I don't always do all of these things in the same day, but what I'm getting at is I stay up late. I get off around 11, home by 11.15, and I won't go to sleep until around 3 or 4 in the morning. The latest being 4 if I'm with my boyfriend. She wakes me up every day from between 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., but it's never just once. She'll do it two to four times in the morning until I can't go back to sleep and I'm mad. She doesn't even wake me up for important things. It's either to complain at me or make me do something for her. I've asked her time and time again to stop waking me up. I have a hard time going back to sleep. Could you please just let me sleep until 11 a.m. and when I'm up, I'll do what you need me to do. But she never listens. Well, currently she's been having work done on her house. The workers are in their final stages, so they're just painting the house. Well, once again, she woke me up at 7.30 a.m. today by barging into my room to move her truck because the workers are here. I groan, get up, and throw on a nightgown she doesn't like. We've had several fights about this nightgown because it's short, even though it's long enough to cover everything it needs to. I looked at myself in the mirror and thought about changing, but instead I smirked and thought to myself, if you can't respect my boundaries, why am I going to respect yours? I keep the nightgown on. I walk out of my room, move the truck, and go back inside. As soon as she sees me while I'm walking back to my room, she starts screaming. That Wayne uterus, you went outside like that? Why do you hate me? She's standing in front of me, trying to block my way from going to my room. I duck underneath her arms and ignore her. My mother starts following me while yelling about me living with her and my father, so I can't be dressing like that around their house, especially when my father and working men are around. I get into my room, close the door, and I'm about to lay back down, and she swings my door open, still trying to argue with me. I can't believe you would embarrass me like that. Put on some clothes. We're talking. I laugh in her face and close the door on her. She attempts to reopen the door, so I grab the handle. I'm not allowed locks on my door. Dude, no, we're not even talking. You're just yelling. The truck is moved. Please leave me alone. She starts sobbing about how everyone is so mean to her. She hates her life and stomps off to call my dad to complain about me. Have you ever had someone wake you up when you were trying to sleep? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. I dare you to wake me up when I'm trying to sleep. I guarantee you'll regret it. My entitled uncle yells at my dad to let him plug in his PS4. Backstory. My uncle was the youngest. He wasn't spoiled like how most younger siblings are. He was actually seen as the disappointment. He did bad things and had a bad attitude his entire life. My dad always felt bad for him, so he let him get away with a lot. On to the story. My uncle, Anne, three cousins, and one of my cousin's new babies all came to visit a little after Christmas in 2016. I was excited to see them, considering they had moved to Montana a while back, and this is my first time seeing them in a while. Everyone gets there, and the first thing I hear from my uncle is, When can I play in my PlayStation? Not a single hello or how are you, just that. My dad tried to be nice and say hi first, but my uncle said, 
Where can you plug in my PlayStation? I need to plug it in. My dad told him he could plug it into the TV in the living room. My uncle plugged everything in and talked to his online friends instead of his own family for 30 to 45 minutes. Everyone was getting to know my cousin's almost year old baby at this point. We were also chatting about life during this time and I found out something shocking. Turns out my uncle has been living in a constant state of fear and paranoia to the point where he doesn't go outside. He was constantly scared he was going to have a seizure when he was outside and didn't want to risk it. He didn't even have a job. His wife worked two jobs to pay for food and housing while her husband stayed home and played video games. I was already mad at the fact that he had put the video games on and was playing them over hanging out with my family, but after hearing that, it was insane. About one hour later, my uncle turns off his PlayStation, then goes over to my dad and asks, Can we order some pizza? My dad says sure, because we were all hungry. My dad was about to order what we normally get, pepperoni and sausage pizza, when my uncle says, Can we also get vegetarian? I'm trying to watch my weight. My dad agreed since he was very helpful on losing weight. However, with the grease of the cheese on the vegetables, it's not going to be that healthy. The food came, and when he was done eating, he went back to his video games. It was so sad to see that he was with his family and didn't really seem to care. My dad, of course, noticed I was upset when everyone was gone. He asked me what it was, and I told him, I know he's your brother, and you want to be nice, but he's not a kid. He needs to spend time with family before he regrets it. My dad said that if something like this ever happened again, he would shut it down. Am I the jerk for being frustrated that my girlfriend doesn't work hard at her job and gets paid nearly twice as much as I do? My girlfriend and I both work in tech. She's a safety validator for software, working at a consulting firm, and I'm doing network infrastructure support. When we both worked in different offices, I didn't know much about her day-to-day -day life at work. I knew she made a lot more than me, $120,000 to my $66,000 and she credits a lot of that to her job hopping. She's 25 and has had three full-time jobs since college. I've been at one place since college. But since we've been working from home, I've seen a lot of her daily schedule, and hers versus mine are really different. She gets up at 9.15 to drag herself into the home office for her 9.30 to 10 daily meeting. After the meeting, she goes and showers and has breakfast from about 10 to 10.45, answering a few Slack messages and emails on her phone, but mostly just listening to podcasts and eating and doing her morning routine. Then she works till noon and takes a lunch break from noon till one. Then she works from one to four, often having meetings or working on her own stuff. And at four, we'll spend an hour or so doing household chores and stuff while keeping an eye on her phone to answer emails. And outside of nine to five, she blocks work-related messages from her phone. So basically, she actually works about four and a half hours daily and then does her own thing for about two hours, just paying enough attention to reply to emails that come in. I basically work non-stop 8.30 to 5 or 6 p.m., working 8.5 to 9.5 hours a day. I don't take breaks in the workday to shower or eat breakfast and lunch or do household chores. And a few weeks ago, I kind of got frustrated with her for basically hardly doing anything for her job at all and that they were overpaying her if she was spending half the day slacking. She got frustrated with me and said that they hired her for her knowledge and it wasn't my place to say what her time was worth. That if her boss and CEO saw the work she produced and chose to pay her what they chose to pay her, that it wasn't my place to undervalue her because I was being jealous and that she picked her job instead of one that might pay better because she wanted a good work-life balance. She was sick of wasting her life away at work that was a lot more demanding. I said that she was being a little privileged. Not a lot of people can choose to make six figures and wander off from work for practically half the day and that all I was saying was that she was working half as hard as a lot of people who earn a lot less. She got mad at me and said that it's not up to me to decide what her time is worth. Am I the jerk for what I said about my girlfriend's work ethic? Well, what do you think? Is OB the jerk or not? Please let us know. You jelly bra? Fine, we can play it that way if you want. I sell cars. I also work for a very corporate run dealership that has a lot of rules and depending on the level of management depends on their ability to discount, blah, blah, blah. I've also been with this dealer for a really long time, so I know how to play the game. It can be a hassle at times, but if you learn how to play your cards right, you can take advantage of their rules. Now we have a rule. Once a new car hits 90 days, we start doing two things. We offer a bonus to the salesperson who sells it. We discount the car to move it. The idea is we want to move our old inventory first. So I'm chilling and I get a call. 
A guy is on a business trip and he says he sees we got a truck he likes. I look it up and I notice it's been on our lot for over 140 days. It doesn't have a clearance discount on it. I give him the price I'm able to and he asks me if I have any wiggle room since it's a 2020 and not a 2021. I go, would 500 do it? He counters me roughly another 200 to bring it below a certain price point. I ask, if I agree, will you give me a deposit right now? He goes, yeah. I go, you know what? Yeah, I'll do it. Let's do a deal. Now, the reason why I said 500 is because I know it's the maximum amount my sales manager can discount a vehicle without approval. When he countered me above that, I knew it was going to be a fight to get the deal accepted, but I figured giving a customer a $700 discount is better than giving him a $2,000 clearance discount. We do the deal. He signs it. I send the deal up for approval. My manager yells at me, tells me I can't do the discount. I explain that it's an aged unit. It's supposed to have a clearance discount and it doesn't, so we should just do it. He says customer has to agree to a higher price. I go, fine, I'll talk to him. So I walk outside, play on my phone, answer some emails, come back and go. Customer says honor the deal or refund him his money. Manager goes, can't do it, refund the money. I go, okie dokie. So I don't refund the money, but I drop the unit back in stock. I call up a higher level manager and point out that he messed up and didn't do anything about this aged inventory. He thanks me for pointing it out and says we'll do $1,500 off and see how quick it sells. I ask, what about a bonus? He goes, if you sell it, I'll give you a $150 bonus. I go, fantastic. Now I work for a dealer that doesn't pay me a percentage, but a set amount per car, so this discount isn't cutting into my commission. I call the customer up and I say, hey, Mr. Customer, I didn't notice it, but this morning, the truck you did a deposit on was included in the clearance list. I'm going to give you a clearance discount and your price is now approximately $800 lower. Customer is super happy, thinks I'm the best guy ever. I'm smiling because I just made an extra $150. Later that afternoon, my manager comes in and goes, Sting, did you drop the truck back in stock? I said, no, customer is going to buy it. He goes, oh, he agreed to a higher price? I smile and go, nope. I got a clearance discount on it. My manager smirks at me and goes, You got a bonus too, didn't you? I smiled and said, Sure did. Malicious compliance as my dealership refused to do the common sense thing and give a customer a $700 manager discount. So instead, they gave him a $1,500 clearance discount and a $150 bonus. Am I the jerk for not using my daughter's college fund to support my future grandchild? I, 45, female have been a single mother to my daughter, who's 18, ever since her father passed when she was a baby. It was hard pulling us through, but we made it. I finished my degree, earned a nice job with a high salary, and we now live comfortable. One of my priorities was setting aside a college fund for my daughter. Her father had started one when he found out I was pregnant, and I chose to add on to it once he passed. When she was 17, I sat down with her and told her that once she's ready for college, to not worry, because I and her dad had saved up enough money for her education. I told her this money could go towards tuition, housing, food, books, etc. She planned on moving into an apartment in the same state as the school and attending some online classes and some in person. Anything to make her college life comfortable and fun, I was willing to offer. I wanted the best for her because when I went to college, I struggled financially. She was grateful and thanked me. Obviously, lockdown has made school different for everyone and senior year of high school was difficult for her. But she was still accepted into one of the top schools in the nation, USA, and I was so proud of her. Four days ago, she set me down and told me that she was pregnant. I was shocked and figured it was an accident. She's due in September, right when school starts. That meant we had to back out signing a lease for her future apartment and would have to stay home to raise the baby. Starting college with a newborn would have been a challenge, but doable, so I accepted it. Until later that night, I overheard, not eavesdrop, her conversation with her boyfriend. She told her boyfriend not to worry about supporting the baby. She would just use her college money for it. I also heard that she had been lying to me. Turns out, she decided to stop taking the pill simply because she wanted to switch to a different one, but she didn't tell me. So for the past three months, she hasn't been taking it. If she wanted to switch to another method, I would have supported it. Next night, I told her that she and her boyfriend would have to find a way to support the baby because her college fund was for college only. She broke down, asking me how she was going to manage to support her baby when she nor her boyfriend had a job. I told her she should have thought about that before getting herself into this situation. She called me a horrible mother and grandmother because I was setting them up for failure. 
I told her that I had set her up for success, yet she chose the route, which made things difficult for her. She told some other family members, and they are saying that I'm the jerk and should think of the child. I replied that while I love my grandchild, I plan on staying firm about the college fund, but now I'm unsure. Am I the jerk? Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Oh, I can't wait to see what our audience thinks about this one. To Karen's husband, whose name isn't Chad. Thank you so much for stopping the rant we both know she was building up to. You are a true hero. Now on with the story. This happened a few moments ago. I'm in the kitchen filling up the cleanser so I can spray my lobby down. I walk out carrying two spray jugs since no one else mixes any when they use it up. There's Karen and her husband, not Chad, standing in the lobby looking around wondering where the night audit is. Me. Good morning. How are you today? Karen gives me a blank stare. Not Chad. Good morning to you. Karen. I want to check out. Me. We can make that happen for you. What's your room number? Karen. This is my room number. Me. Give me a moment and I'll get you some paper airplane material. Are you guest names here? And did you sleep well? Karen, debating on if she should let me have it, decides for the moment I'm not worth it. I slept just fine till you checked someone in in the room next door. Me. Well, I do apologize that you were disturbed, but I only checked one guest in. That was at midnight and they were on the opposite side of the hotel. Karen. Whatever. Give me my receipt. I hand over the receipt and she stares at it for 10 minutes then starts to walk out the door, stops and turns around. This isn't me. I said this room number. Room right next door. Me. Oh, I do apologize. It's for the room she originally told me, but I'll take this on the chin. Karen. Why did they pay less? Me. You both paid through hooking, so I don't have an answer for you on that. Hooking is a separate third-party organization that sets its own prices, and we do not change them at all. Not Chad breaks in as Karen's face starts to turn an ugly shade of red. I don't care. Get in the car, Karen. It's not worth arguing over $2. Karen at this point is visibly debating on if she should let us both have it, but Not Chad has left the building, so she rushes out to get in the car. Thanks, Not Chad. And thanks for taking one for the hotel front desk team. We appreciate your efforts. Am I the jerk for not letting my employee cut down her hours? I own my own company and have a dozen employees. Our hours of operation are 7.30 to 6. Not every employee works a full day. Most don't. At least once a week, everyone gets a chance to cut out by 3. Not all on the same day, but everyone gets a turn. One of my employees came to me last week and said that their kid's school has gone remote for the remainder of the year. They asked to change their hours to 10 to 4.30 every day as their spouse works early mornings and doesn't get home until 9.30. I said yes, she could start at 10, but to keep benefits, she had to remain full-time. That means working 10 to 6 every day, as that'll just get her to 40 hours a week. I also said she couldn't have an early day anymore, as that would also take her out of full-time hours. She got mad and said that hours were flexible. I said start times are flexible for those that come in by 8. If I let her leave at 4.30 every day, someone else wouldn't get an early day, and that's not fair to them when they get here every day at 7 to 7.30. I asked if she had a reason to need to leave at 4.30, such as childcare, appointment, etc. I have kids. I get it. She said no. She wanted to limit her hours and keep her benefits. She proposed working 10 to 4.30 three times a week and 10 to 2.30 on the other two days. That would leave her at 22.5 hours a week, factoring in her 30-minute break on those long days. This schedule just isn't fair to other people, leaving me without coverage if I did still let others leave early. Basically, this ended with her agreeing to work 10 to 6 every workday. As she was leaving, she made a comment how I don't get being a mom. I'm a single mom. She's also one of the six employees that also have kids and managed to figure it out or they're part-time because they can't. Am I being the jerk here? My employee has been short with me ever since we had this talk. Edit. There has been the same misinformation repeating. It is rare anyone but me, the boss, works 7.30 to 6.00. If an employee comes in at 7.30, they leave at 2.30. We're simply operating as a company from 7.30 to 6. The later you come in, the later you stay, like any job. For example, I have one employee that starts at 9 a.m. He leaves at 6. Employee in my story had the same schedule for years. I cannot control part-time not getting insurance. My employees pay a percentage through their checks, and I have investors that pay the remainder. But they only pay for full-time employees. I have eight full-time employees, four part-time. It's what we're budgeted for. The issue is not them wanting to be part-time. 
If they were okay with losing benefits, I'd let them do so and hire someone to cover the slack. They're not okay with losing benefits. Everyone starts out at $20 an hour with yearly raises. And finally, yes, I'm aware 30 plus hours is the norm for benefits. It's just at this company, people are either working 40 hours or they work less than 25. There's no real in between. Am I the jerk for correcting my boyfriend's friend? My boyfriend, 25, wanted to introduce me, 22, female, to a couple of his friends, around 25, all male, earlier this week. I already knew his closest friends. The ones I'm talking about here are a little more in the bigger circle. We set up a Skype call, just me and my boyfriend, we live together, a few other guys, and one dude I'm gonna call Mike. Two things you need to know. They are all pretty big nerds. Marvel, DC, video games, Star Wars, Star Trek, you name it. They know and love it. Two, I'm not that much of a nerd, but I know my stuff when it comes to Star Wars. I don't mean to brag, but my knowledge is very extensive. So we were talking, everything was going smoothly. Somehow the conversation shifts to Star Wars and how Palpatine was able to turn Anakin to the dark side and Mike says that he finds it a little exaggerated to love a woman that much that you betray your best friend in order to protect her. In an attempt to have a conversation, I answer. I'd go to extreme lengths too if I had already lost my mother. He laughed and told me that Shmi had nothing to do with Anakin's fall. I said that it's in the novel, and in the movie too I think, that Anakin was already distraught that he had to leave Shmi behind. He had visions of Shmi dying and it happened, and then he had visions of Padme dying, and he would have done everything in his power to make sure that that did not happen. It went a little back and forth that way. My boyfriend and the other guys were completely silent at this point. Then Mike said the following, and I quote, Look, you're a girl. You don't know Star Wars as well as we do. You're wrong. And now shut it and make your boyfriend a sandwich. That last part was probably supposed to be a joke, but I was not having it. I told him that he was an idiot if he really believed that my gender had anything to do with my knowledge on the topic and that I expected a sincere apology from him. He laughed. I ended the call in response and my evening was ruined. My boyfriend looked it up and later told me that not only I was right, but I also did the right thing. Mike brought this down to a personal level, and his joke was crossing a line. He supports my side completely. So far, so good. This morning, I told my best friend what happened, and she got a little annoyed. She told me that I should not have called him a name, and that I should have just sucked it up if I wanted to actually make friends. And now, I'm really unsure about my behavior. She's right that I should not have called him a name, but am I the jerk for not keeping my mouth shut? Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk here, or is Mike? Please let us know. How long do you think this guy's neckbeard is? Block my pay because, as per your instruction, I violated the rules? Enjoy having your own income reduced. This all happened a few years back when I was in high school and distributing bundles of weekly advertising brochures around a neighborhood as a means to earn some spending money. What is important to note is that I did not work directly for the company that made these bundles. Instead, there was the middleman who was also paid by the company and who oversaw multiple neighborhoods in my area. When I got my first stack of bundles, in total this would be around 80 kilograms of paper, I noticed that I had a lot of leftovers after doing my round. This is because here in the Netherlands, you cannot put advertisements in someone's mailbox when they have a no advertisement sticker on it. I informed the middleman of this, asking if I could tell him how many bundles were left over and he could make sure I got less of them. His response was that I would need to do a check of the sticker on my route and report the exact addresses that did not want to receive the advertisements. I realized that this would cost me a lot of time and asked if this would be paid. His response was that I would not get paid for this and that my total pay would also decrease as I would be delivering fewer bundles. But then he said, you can also just dump them in the paper trash. That also works. I'm guessing that he preferred that option as it would save him some administrative work and because he probably also would have his earnings lowered by the main company, then the surplus would be reported. This would probably also spark some questions as to the situation on the other routes he was responsible for. So, doing as he told me, once a month when the paper trash was collected, I put the leftovers in the bin, and that was that. Sometimes our own bin would be too full, so I'd put them in another bin that was already on the street, as we do not pay per weight that is collected. This would not hurt the neighbors at all. This went on for about a year without any problems. The company, and especially this dude, were huge pains in the butt delivering far too late for me to complete my route and forgetting when I was not available, resulting in them having to pick up all bundles from my house again after delivering them to me and then getting mad because they forgot that I was not available. One day, my neighbors also started working for this company and this dude and they noticed some bundles in the trash. 
They told this dude, and here it comes. He blocked my pay and said I was fired immediately. The part that I was fired actually was fine with me. I quit two weeks prior, so I only had two weeks to go. So I got out sooner than I expected, which was nice. The part about blocking my pay annoyed me. He said that I violated the rules, but I pointed out that I just followed his rules. After some messaging back and forth, he did not reply for a while. That's when I decided to dial up the main company, who were in charge of paying out the salaries. I explained the whole story, including my instruction to dump the bundles to them. They apologized and made sure I was paid out. When I told this to the middleman, he was quite upset. I can only imagine the amount of crap he must have gotten from the main company for his behavior. I know that my neighbors had to do a check of all the addresses after I left, so he probably had everyone do the check and saw his pay fall by a considerable margin. Probably 20%, as that was what was left over every week. Karen flips out that I won't get her a pair of shoes. Hello everybody, never expected to be posting here, so this just happened a few hours ago now, and I still can't get over the absurdity of it all. Since lockdown has happened, I've been going on walks every day so I can get exercise, also because I need to walk my dogs. I don't have a lot of shoes as I don't have a lot of money and so I try to limit excessive amounts of stuff. Lockdown has been really relaxed in my country as the cases are only average. I recently sold some old tech so that I could get some money to buy some new shoes as my old shoes have a few holes in the sole. I managed to make around 80 pounds from selling and so I was going to buy some decent shoes that wouldn't wear out. Now to get into the story. I had gone to Sports Direct to get a nice pair of shoes as I know they have some really good deals on at the moment near me. Now, the uniform for Sports Direct is a black polo shirt with white stripes and the logo on the back, an optional hoodie, and any pair of dark trousers or jeans, preferably black. I had decided to wear my Adidas polo shirt that my dad had given me, since it didn't fit him anymore, with a pair of maroon jeans along with my very worn out shoes. I had found a pair of walking boots that were pretty expensive and I was having a look at them, asked about them, but then found they didn't have my size, so I went to go put it back on the shelf. Enter Karen. Karen, spinning me around by the shoulder. Excuse me? In that typical snotty tone. I've been waiting for ages for service. Now, do you have these shoes in a size 6? Me, obviously alarmed. Sorry, can you please not touch me? And also, I don't know if this store does. I, Karen, scoffing. What the heck do you mean you don't know if this store does? It's your duty to know. Now, go serve me and check to see if you have a size 6. Me. No, it's really not. Also, where is your mask? It's mandatory to wear one in stores, you know. Karen. No, no, no. I can't wear a mask. I can't breathe. It covers my nose. How would I be able to breathe? Just get me my size 6 shoes already. Now, I was getting irritable at this point. I hadn't slept that well as it was too hot and I didn't have a fan. Oh, I forgot to mention. I'm only 15 and about 5 foot. Do you see a small problem? I have a baby face anyway, and sure my mouth and nose was covered, but I didn't look a day past 13 at max. Me. Please miss, I'm 15 years old. I'm just here to get a pair of shoes for myself. Karen, almost hissing at this point. You. You liar. You obviously work here. I saw you put a pair of shoes back on the shelf, and you're wearing the shirt. Don't you dare lie to me. Me. Oh my god, I'm done with being polite. I've tried to tell you that I don't work here. I'm 15 years old and I'm a customer. How narcissistic are you that you think everything you think is right? Karen, mouth as wide as a snake's. How dare you speak to me like that, missy? I'll have you fired for that. Now, call your manager over with your radio. Me, looking down. Oh, look, I have no radio. Doesn't that indicate something to you? By now, the few people that were in the store were looking over, and an employee had come over. Employee. Excuse me, what's going on, and how can I help? Karen. This disrespectful girl has refused to get me the shoe size I requested, and is insulting me. I demand to speak to the manager and talk about getting her fired. Employee then looks to me, staring at me for a few seconds with a confused look on his face before he looked back to Karen. Employee. I'm sorry, miss, but she doesn't work here. Also, where- No, no, no. You can't just cover for your friend when she did something wrong. Get me the manager. Karen went into an absolute tantrum, stomping her foot and not listening to anybody that tried to talk to her. Reluctantly, after a few seconds, employee walked off to find his manager. 
Karen noticed and then looked to me with a grin that looked like she thought she had won. The floor manager then came over about a minute later, and at this point I found a pair of shoes that I was going to buy, so I was holding the shoe in my hand. Floor manager. Sorry miss, I was told to come over to resolve the issue, but I'm afraid I can't have you in the store without a mask. Do you have one on you? If not, you can buy one for two pounds. Karen. No, I won't wear one when I can't breathe in it. Now, do something about this disrespectful girl. Karen pointed to me. Floor manager looked to me holding the shoe, then turned his attention to me. Floor manager. Hi there, did you need something? Me. I had just come here because I needed a new pair of shoes. Do you have these in a size 5? I showed him the shoe and Karen went into an absolute frenzy. Floor manager completely blanked her and went on one of his devices to see what they had in stock. Karen was going ballistic, yelling at me and the manager and the store, everybody. Floor manager. Yes, we do. Would you like to meet me at the counter? I'll get you the pair and box them for you. Floor manager had told employee to call the police to escort Karen out. And what ended up happening is that Karen not only got kicked out, she got fined for not wearing a mask too. I think she ended up going back to the police station and I ended up getting a small discount on my shoes for what I put up with. I was talking with floor manager and he ended up joking that I should work for them because of the shirt. I just need to get new trousers. That was the end of the story pretty much. I even had enough money to go to Subway nearby, so I got myself a sub, cookie, and a drink. I think I'll have to thoroughly clean my shirt though after Karen put her disgusting hands on it. Sorry this was so long. Thanks for reading this all the way through if you did. Speaking of shoes, what are your favorite kind of shoes to wear? Please let us know. Flip flops with diamonds for the win, bruh. Karen's stepdaughter expects me to pay for her college. I set her straight. I met my partner Madison five years ago. Madison has a daughter from her ex named Allie, who's 17, and I have a 15-year-old son from my previous relationship. They are both with us full time. I would say since the first week we started dating that Allie never liked me. I've tried to bond with her, extending an olive branch to being able to simply coexist, but it's uneasy at best. She tells her mom the reason she dislikes me so much is because her mother moved in with me and moved away from her dad. They moved half an hour away with traffic. Madison is unable to work many jobs. She has a felony on her record. She was mailing high-priced bottles of bourbon across state lines at 23 and has a god-awful back that lays her up days at a time. With that said, I handle the expenses, which isn't a problem. I'm an engineer with a high wage and overtime is limitless if I want it. Allie makes life difficult when she can. She mocks me to my face, refuses to do chores, breaks into my wine cellar, and lately has been making fun of me with her dad via Facebook and Twitter. They enjoy calling me a nerd and a loser because I play Dungeons and Dragons and I guess because I'm basically different. Everyone can see what they say about me on there and it's embarrassing to say the least. Her mother stands up for me and tries to control it but it doesn't last. Allie's dad isn't a saint even though she thinks he is. He's in and out of trouble, can't hold a steady job and he still lives with his mom. I'm not trying to be harsh on the guy here but at least here it's anonymous, which is better than he gives me on Facebook. Recently, Allie has been jumping through the hoops of college applications and she and her mother sat down to discuss options and whatnot. Allie isn't a great student, but she isn't terrible either. She's not going to get many, if any at all, scholarships or grants. Madison asked me about tuition and I said I would match Allie's dad dollar for dollar. They kind of stared at me for a minute until my son broke the tension with a laugh and said, well, that might cover the gas to drop her off. I asked him to leave the kitchen, and he did. However, my wife was livid, and Allie was on the verge of crying. Allie left the kitchen, and my girlfriend said that was out of line and cruel for an adult to say that to someone her age. I shot back with, well, someone needed to set her straight, and you or her father weren't doing it, and now she will see her dad for what he really is. Guys, I'm tired of it. I didn't do anything to this girl, and I really tried to be there for her. I don't deserve to be treated like this, especially in my own home. I'm just tired of it all. I'm thinking of just ending it with Madison so I can be rid of Allie. I really love Madison, but her daughter should come first for her, and it's getting to a point where she's dead last for me. Am I the jerk for my remarks? Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or is Allie? Please let us know. Cry me a river, Allie. Cry me a river. Boss presents a horrible contract and says I can quit if I don't want to sign. So, I do. I used to work for a local youth center, kind of. I won't name them. The story goes like this. 
the man who ran the center knew a friend of a family who told him I was going to college for graphic design and video. He calls me and lets me know that under the umbrella of the youth center, he wanted to revive an old local magazine and wanted it to be run by youth. I was 18. He said that as well as a physical magazine, there was going to be a video component that would go on YouTube and the website and that I would be a great fit for the team to help with this. He also said that they would assist in getting all participating youth started towards their own business. I was thinking, wow, I'll have a job right out of college. This is great. I was promised on the job training, an eventual pay increase to $18 an hour and a lot of other stuff. I started at $14 an hour. I won't go into every detail, but basically I was told that I was to write articles for the magazine as well, as all employees would do this. No problem. Slowly but surely, we built a small team. I recommended a friend from college who would eventually become the editor. Let's call her editor. Another person who would become my friend was hired and directed and edited a lot of videos I worked on. We'll call him director. And there was also a sound technician named Rapper. There were other employees as well, but the four of us were the main magazine crew. The rest helped, but mostly worked at the youth center for youth reasons. Now that I've explained that, we can get into it. Over the course of my employment, a lot of shady things happened. The center claimed that they would help us start our own businesses and we should get business licenses and they would contact us. In reality, this was a way for them to avoid paying taxes and making us do it instead. As well, there were a lot of make a video about blank orders, but no instructions until the finished video was handed in. We did stories on a lot of cultural topics, so this could be really difficult at times. On top of that, the boss was almost never there, so when we had questions, we basically had to figure things out ourselves. Despite all of this, I was loyal. I worked there for two years and I'm confident that I was a major reason we were going for a while because whenever somebody messed something up in video, I was the one they came to to fix it. Sometimes with hours left to deadline. I filmed almost all the events we covered. I knew where all of the files were for everything, the passwords and a lot more. People asked me about all of these things when they forgot. I also managed the YouTube page all by myself. But for whatever reason, the boss started to trust us less and less. Locks were changed on the doors so none of our keys worked. Director and I were placed in an office where somebody was constantly watching us. Our time cards were argued about and we were accused of only playing video games while at work. We played our switches at lunch. I think he had trust issues because he's a sketchy person. He had the kind of fake being friends with everyone in case you need a favor view on life. Director and I started to be blamed for bad camera framing when we weren't even at the shoot. This got to the point where we were told to take extra training, but editor, who was mostly responsible for these mistakes, was treated like a queen. Even if I complained about something editor had done, nothing would ever come of it. Then comes December of 2018. Boss calls a meeting. He tells us all that the magazine will be transitioning into its own business separate from the youth center. Here, on top of video and writing duties, we will be searching for contracts and driving to other cities in our province to film. He then proceeds to hand us a contract that we're required to sign if we continue to work for him. This contract sucks. There were a lot of things in there that would do us over, but the main things were that while working for them, we wouldn't be allowed to conduct our own contracts. And if we quit, we can't work in our field in any of the whole province for six months. On top of that, our job titles would be changed to interns and our pay would stay the same even though we were promised $18 an hour. Literally, all of us were mad about this contract, but whenever we brought up problems, he would say, this is non-negotiable, it's a perfectly normal contract. He also accused me of trying to find loopholes whenever I tried to discuss it. I have no idea about contracts, but if you're claiming to start youth up on their own businesses, this is not how you do it. He let us know to aid with the transfer to a new business, he was in talks for a new contract worth a lot of money. He didn't disclose how much, probably so we wouldn't feel entitled to be paid for more doing all the work. He gave us a week to look at the contract. After that, there would be one week until Christmas. I spent all of the week dreading the next Monday when I had to make a decision. I begged boss to change it, but he stood firm. He even indicated that if we weren't happy with it, we might as well quit. This is important. Then, on the Friday evening, I noticed that my job is listed on a job board. I'm shocked. I check Facebook, the magazine website, and everything. My passwords are removed. I have no login. He's trying to strong arm me into signing. Then, on Monday, my girlfriend and I get breakfast before I go in when I get a text from director letting me know he got fired upon walking into the building. 
my gears start to turn in my head. If he fired director, then he's definitely counting on having me to do all of the work still. I know that I won't get fired because I'm the only person capable of making videos properly. So instead of going to work, my girlfriend and I type up a letter of resignation, walk over to Staples and print it out, and bring it over to work. Before I give it to him, he greets me and lets me know that he fired director. The casual way he talks to me about it confirms he expects me to stay, but he did this to himself by listing my job and arrogantly stating that we should quit if we didn't like the contract. So I hand him an envelope which has my letter in it. What's this Aqualink 97? My letter of resignation. He is shocked, but accepts. I think in that moment, he finally realized that his actions have consequences. Then he walks inside. I say goodbye to everybody, hugs all around, pack up my stuff, then find him crying in the sound room. I talk to director later and he tells me that his mom was connected to boss's huge paying contract and that he actually hadn't had the contract yet. Director's mom was really upset and since they hadn't signed anything yet, she pulled some strings and got director the contract instead. Turns out it was worth something like $60,000. So basically, the boss tried to strong arm us into signing a crappy contract, then lost the only competent employee and a $60,000 contract. Editor and rapper eventually quit too. Rapper decided to focus on his music career and is doing pretty well for himself. I worked video contracts for a while until I got a full-time job again. So as a result of all of his crappiness and overall arrogance, Boss no longer has enough money to print an actual magazine, is short-staffed, constantly going through new employees who always end up quitting and rarely uploads videos. Their videos have crappy titles too, like the title of the camera footage and rarely have edited thumbnails. I think it's safe to say we destroyed his ambition of starting a business exploiting people right before Christmas. And just to be clear, even though I had the effects that my quitting would have on him in mind, I also knew that the youth center was funded separately from us, so we didn't ruin any poor kids' lives. Have you ever had a boss try to take advantage of you? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for embarrassing my influencer friend by intentionally letting her post a meme that made her look stupid? I feel kind of bad, but I have a friend who thinks of herself as a highly popular mom influencer. She's in her 40s, and she has a habit of taking other people's posts, memes, etc., and reposting them as her own. She even steals personal, heartfelt words from other bloggers and Instagrammers about their own struggles with body image, depression, etc., and slightly changes them to repost as her own. She's grown a decent following from this and gets sponsored by brands for keeping it real. Honestly, I'll admit, part of me is likely jealous, so I'll own that. But mostly, I just think it's gross that she is lying and making up a whole personality that has people thinking she's something she's not. Anyway, there's this challenge going around on social media called the Hidden Cat Challenge, and I thought it would be funny to send her a photo of Monica's apartment from friends and say, bet you can't find the cat in this photo. I figured she'd recognize it and laugh, but within a few minutes, she had posted it on all of her social media telling people that it was her latest Airbnb and making up an elaborate backstory about a random cat that lived there and challenging people to find it. I messaged her asking why she would lie and she just said that she needed content and no one would ever know. So I just kept my mouth shut and sat back to see what would happen. Obviously, people immediately began calling her out and she tried to defend herself, but it wasn't long before she took it down and had to turn off comments on all of her social accounts. She's now telling me I'm the jerk for letting her post it, and I may have cost her sponsors and taken food out of her kids' mouths. Am I the jerk? Edit. Just to clarify, I had no idea she was going to post it. The whole point was that the photo didn't even have a cat in it. It was a joke. She posted it with a whole fake story and tried to make people find the non-existent cat in the photo, which added hugely to her embarrassment. After she got mad, I even tried to help by suggesting she simply tell people she accidentally posted the wrong photo or even say it was a joke, but she locked down her profiles, which obviously made her look bad. None of our friends blame me, but she is seriously upset and is refusing to speak to me. I never intended to make her look bad, but since she brushed me off when I first called her out, I figured I'd just let it play out. I guess that is why she thinks I'm the jerk. Well, what do you think? Is OB the jerk or is their friend? Please let us know. Lying has consequences. Some people have to learn the hard way. That's illegal. Just because he's okay with it doesn't mean you should sell it to him. This happened about a few years ago. I worked as a sales rep for one of the larger phone carriers in the US. 
It was a slow night and the store was empty when this guy came in. He wanted to upgrade his phone, Phone 1, which he had just got two months ago on monthly payments. He also was not on our upgrade program. He had already decided he wanted Phone 2. At this point, he owed about $550 on Phone 1 and the trade-in value was only about $100. Yeah, trade was horrible rates at the time. I told him about this and he said he didn't care. He then went on for 10 minutes bragging about how he had just got a raise, is making crazy money, he can afford to buy 5 of the phone too. I just sat there listening to him. I then told him that I wouldn't recommend trading in phone 1 because he would still have to make monthly payments on the remaining balance, plus another monthly payment for phone 2, which was a more expensive phone. I should note, he wasn't the primary on the account, his wife was, but he was authorized. I asked if his wife would be okay with it and he said he didn't need her permission to do what he wants. He ended up trading in phone 1 and getting phone 2, plus he spent over $400 on accessories. All along, I continued to recommend that he does not do this. Before making the sale or a trade-in, I got my manager involved so he could talk to the customer and make sure the customer understood what he was doing. In all, I told him seven times not to do it, plus my manager twice. He still did it. So after the sale, following procedure, I made notes in the account detailing everything that happened. Fast forward two days, the store gets a call and they ask for me. It was customer service who had the wife on the phone who wanted to talk to me. We've got me and we've got the wife and customer service. Me. Thank you for calling the store. This is OP. Customer service. Hi OP. I have the wife on the phone and she wanted to talk to you about the sale you made to her husband. Me. Okay, what can I do for you, the wife? The wife. Do you think what you did was okay? Me. I'm sorry, what was that? Do you think what you did was okay? Taking advantage of my husband. Me. I'm not sure what you mean. Karen. You convinced my husband to buy a new phone, and you took his two-month-old phone and gave him basically nothing for it. Me. I understand, ma'am. I informed your husband many times about what would happen and recommended multiple times that he should not do that. Karen raises her voice. That is bad business and unethical. You should not have sold him anything. I am a business owner, and I would never take advantage of a customer the way you did. If you knew it was a bad idea, it's your job not to sell it. Me. Ma'am, I made... Cuts me off. Seriously, what you did is just unethical and wrong. Do you understand that? What you did is illegal. You can't just sell it to him if you think it's wrong. Me. I know. Cuts me off again. You should not have sold it to him. We want the phone he traded in back. We are also returning all the accessories you sold him on. This is so messed up. Now, I'm getting annoyed for being blamed for this. It's clear the husband told her a different story. I didn't mention to her, people do things like this at least once a month. Me. Okay, I made every effort to help your husband. He came into our store bragging about how much money he's making and how he can buy whatever he wanted. Even five of these phones. That said, I even got my manager involved so he could hear it from someone else. You cuts me off. Oh, even your manager was in on it? Wait until I talk to corporate about your store's unethical tactics. Me. Okay, Karen. At this point, there's nothing I can do for you on the phone. You can return the accessories, and if you'd like, you can talk to my manager about what happened when you get here. Anything else I can do for you? Tell me why you sold the phone to him and thought it was okay to do so. Me. Ma'am, as I told you, you can discuss this with my manager when you get here. Anything else I can do for you? Yeah, answer my last question. This is just bad business. Me. Once again, ma'am, there's nothing on the phone I can do for you. We will gladly help you in my store when you get here. Have a good day. I hang up. The only thing I was not going to tell her over the phone is that once her husband traded in the phone, there was no way to get it back, as all trade-ins are final. His trade-in phone was already shipped out. The couple come in later that day and she was upset. The husband, however, didn't say a word. I'll skip the dialogue on this one because it was way too long. Simply put, my manager backed me up the entire time he helped them return the accessories. I couldn't help myself and went over there and started repeating everything that the husband had bragged to me about and I even added the line about how he didn't need his wife's permission. The look she gave him when I said that was the best redemption I could ever have. He tried blaming everything on me and now I was able to bury him for it. After that, she lightened up a little. She then returned the new phone, removed his name as an authorized user, and bought him a flip phone. Speaking of phones, what kind of phone do you have? Please let us know.
Where my iPhone family at, bruh? Am I the jerk for changing the password on an account I own that my ex was using to make money? So, long story, but please stay with me. My ex-boyfriend and I broke up in 2017, and while we were dating, he was using an online gaming service at my name and started a game modding business. When we broke up, I allowed him to continue using my gaming account because I didn't have a computer to play on, because he kept the gaming computer he had purchased me as a gift, along with every gift he had ever purchased for me. But he wouldn't let me take any gifts I'd purchased for him, including a high-end drone and a 3D printer. In March of 2019, I got an email from the gaming service company stating that I was locked out of my account. I contacted the company and was told that someone had put in a claim to change the email and claimed the account was theirs and they no longer had access to that email. We spoke via Facebook Messenger and he argued that he was just trying to get his games moved off of my account but not that he was trying to take the whole thing. I provided screenshots showing where I had purchased several of the games he was trying to take. We agreed that I would allow him to continue using the account in the meantime. I don't know why, but I didn't feel like arguing with him anymore. While using the account, he had someone gifting games to my email and my account for him to use for his business. I got a gaming computer late last year and decided to play my games again, but upon downloading, realized that I didn't have access to online features when he was playing. I played offline for a while, but I hated not having access to all of the features, so I stopped playing for a bit. Now, I got married last October, and after talking to my husband, we decided that it was weird that my ex-boyfriend had access to my account. I finally plucked up the courage to change the login credentials after talking to my therapist and some friends. Now he's threatening to take me to small claims court over these games if I don't either give him access to my account and have him pay me for all of the games I purchased, some of which are no longer available for download, or me pay him for all of the games he purchased or were gifted to my account. I asked my husband to message him because I was having a panic attack. I read my husband's message. It was very polite, but he stated that we would counter sue if he took us to small claims court and asked my ex not to contact us again unless through legal discourse. He messaged me afterward saying that my husband was trying to intimidate him and that I have a time frame to tell him which course I'd like to take. Am I the jerk here? Edit. So after reading more of the terms of service for the company, they do not allow accounts to be sold or transferred. Thank you to the person who DM'd me and helped me figure that out, and thank you to everyone who has commented. Edit. Holy cow, I woke up and this exploded, so update. I sent him a copy of the terms of service last night and told him not to contact me unless through a lawyer. He told me he'd see me in court, so we'll see what happens next. Thank you all again for the advice and comments. Crazy Karen doesn't like that I smoke cigars in my own vehicle, tries to grab one out of my mouth, gets what she deserves. People have lost that last bit of sanity during these troubling times. Okay, so as the title states, I smoke cigars. Mostly cheap factory rejects, but an occasional good one too. I do not smoke in my house or around other people, as I know a very select group of people enjoy that particular aroma. Other points to note here. I drive my youngest to and from school, which is less than a mile away, seeing as the weather in my neck of the woods is bipolar at best. So, setting. Yesterday afternoon, I'm parked way outside school zone in a line to pick up kids, probably a block away in a residential neighborhood. I drive a big truck with a loud exhaust system. Players, we've got me, we've got Karen, and we've got the principal. I'm in the line of vehicles, engine off, listening to a good book on Audible, smoking the last bit of a good cigar. For those who don't know, a cigar can be set down and refreshed if it needs to be. Also, I never do this on school grounds and always have it out before my kid gets in the truck. It's my truck and no one else drives it, so I don't mind the smell and I have a bottle of Febreze that I use every couple of days. Anyway, about five minutes later, I see a woman get out of her car and begin to approach me. I watched her walk up past the two vehicles behind me and head my way. She's got the typical Karen looks, hair, clothes, way too much makeup and the like. She comes up right on my window and just stands there looking at me. I rolled my window down all the way and asked her if she needed anything dialogue as follows. Karen, what the heck do you think you're doing? Me, excuse me? Karen, you're doing drugs. You should be ashamed of yourself. Me, what in the blue heck are you talking about? Karen, I can see it in your hand and smell it. Me, well, obviously you can't smell it because this is a cigar. Karen, I don't think so. I'm calling the police. Knock yourself out, you dumb jerk. After her brain short circuits from being called a jerk, she tried to open my door, which was locked. Then she reached in my window and tried to grab the cigar out of my mouth. 
Now, life has taught us all from a very young age that fire is hot and things that burn from fire are also hot. But physics never seems to be on forefront of these morons. So she immediately burned her hand on the cigar and jumped back, screaming that I did that on purpose. I started laughing because it was very funny. She then tried the door again and I obliged by opening it as hard as I could, which knocked her back onto the ground, which made me laugh even more. Karen, you jerk, I'm going to report you for assault. I'm going to get you and your kid kicked out of here. Me, yeah, whatever Karen, go back to your car before you have a heart attack. She walked back to her car, all the while yelling at me. I made sure to keep an eye on her in my rear view until we got closer to the school. Now, the school principal is always outside directing traffic between the parents and school buses. He and I know each other because being in a northern state, but being fans of the U of Miami is not something you see a lot of up here. So we've talked about football and other stuff about the school. God, that was a disappointing season. So he knows me a little and my truck is unique in size, color, and exhaust. As I'm waiting to pull up to the place where you pick up your kid, I see the Karen Park, get out, and head directly towards the principal. She made sure to walk by me and give me dirty looks, like I guess that was supposed to intimidate me or something. Spoiler alert, it did not. She gave the principal an earful. Couldn't quite hear what she was saying, but she made sure to be as dramatic as possible. Principal is doing his best to direct traffic and put up with her BS, and I assume said something to placate her because she walked away all smug and again made sure to walk by me so I could see her smile again. I pulled up and my kid got in, and as I figured he would, the principal comes over to me. Principal, did you really put out a cigar on her hand and slam your door into her head? Me, that's so stupid, I don't even know where to start. First, she reached into my vehicle and tried to get the cigar out of my mouth and burned her own hand like an idiot. Second, she tried to open my door not once, but twice, so I obliged her the second time. Third, if I had opened the door as hard as I could into her, she'd be knocked out on the road. If she got bruised along with her ego, that's just tough luck. Principal size. That's about what I thought happened. Just do me a favor and don't retaliate. I don't need another headache. Me. No worries for me, man. Just here to pick up the kid. Go Canes! My kid put up the U symbol as we drove away, and that's it. I'll be picking up the kid later today again, so hopefully there's no repeat of that nonsense. The $15,000 equipment is too expensive for your department to purchase? Why don't you just rent it for $48,000 a year? Back in the days when 33.6 kilobytes per second modems were hot crap, I worked for the engineering department for a growing company. This company had started small. It was privately owned and the VPs had all put in a portion of their own money to start the company. By this time in the story, they were finally making a respectable 30 to 40 million a year in profits, but they still acted like a small company, penny pinching. Our engineering department was designing circuit boards with embedded computer systems, and to program these, instead of soldering the microcomputer to the board, we would solder on a microcontroller socket and then plug in an in-circuit emulator that would pretend it was a microcontroller and allow the programmer to create the required program. This in-circuit emulator, or ICE, was made by Hitachi. It plugged into a free PCI slot on your PC and had a ribbon cable that would attach to the specialized microcontroller die that plugged into the socket. It was a mess. It gave our tiny IT department headaches and it cost $15,000. And it was an absolute necessity for most of our most popular product lines. And there was only one of them. And we were renting it. It cost like $4,000 a month. The first month we had it, our CTO and marketing VP planned our whole new product line around this family of microcontrollers. So at the end of the month, us engineers asked management to buy this for us, since we would be using it for a while. The engineering VP saw the price tag and told us to just rent it. Surely we wouldn't be done with it soon. Engineers, being practical, forgot about the objection and just put our noses to the wheel. The CTO and marketing made plans to keep us busy using this microcontroller line for a while. They pre-ordered a few million chips. After a year, the VP of Finance asked about this recurring contract line item. They called the engineer who had originally started the contract. The engineer helpfully forwarded the approval from the engineering VP and his later email asking to buy it and the VP's reply where he demurred. By the end of the week, this toy was ours, along with a second one since finance determined that product rollout was being affected by not enough access to the equipment. Hitachi just gave us the first one, stopped charging us, and never asked for it back. We paid $15,000 for a second one. No one got fired or demoted, 
But the next department meeting, the engineering VP tried to tell us that we didn't have enough money to upgrade our PCs. That one engineer spoke up. Would 40000 cover it? The company found the money. Crazy neighbor tells daughter that she can play in my garden without my permission. I was watching birds in the garden through my window. I was really bored and had nothing to do. I was just about to take a photo of one really pretty bird when my neighbor's kid ran into my garden without permission. She started running around with her bubbles, also scaring the birds off and singing to herself, like a lot of kids do. I opened the door and was about to ask her why she was there, but she got scared and ran off. I called the girl's mom, Helen, and asked her why her daughter was in my garden running around. At first she was confused, but I was sure that it was her kid. She then said, Oh, now I remember. But why are you calling? Is she not allowed to be there? I said, No, she ran into my garden without permission and started scaring the birds I was watching. So, you can watch your dumb little bird some other time. I sent out my daughter into your garden and you don't have permission to kick her off. I was now really angry. First of all, I did not kick her off. She ran away on her own. Second of all, this is my garden and I say who's allowed in here and who's not. You do not have the right to send her here. She seemed offended and hung up. I rolled my eyes and went outside to make sure she didn't come back. I noticed she crushed one of the vegetables I planted. I don't remember what it was, but it was about to be old enough to take out and use. She lived on the other side of the street, but she was with some other neighbors to have a talk. Since I was outside now, I saw where this neighbor was and heard her say to her daughter, You can go on that man's garden. He won't do anything. I was raging. I went closer to her and said, Helen, I don't know why you think you can buy my Nintendo Switch for $20 and let your daughter in my garden whenever you want. This is not normal, and I'm sick of you doing these things. I'm not the only neighbor who thinks this. Almost half of the street agrees. If you want to do this, go ask other neighbors and stop doing it to me. She went silent and turned kind of red. Her daughter started crying. She cries all the time, and they both stormed away. I heard her shout to me, My husband is a police officer, and I'll make sure that he will have a word with you. I once again rolled my eyes and also went back home. Am I the jerk for refusing to accommodate my niece's vegan diet? My sister and her husband both lost their jobs, and as we had the space, we allowed them to move in with us. They have two daughters who are both vegan. Now, my wife and I have four kids. Our two older girls are very sweet, and our boys both have autism. We essentially work our daily lives around them to make them more comfortable. As such, our meal plans are relatively simple. Some of the only foods they will both eat is chicken and cheese, so every meal we eat has at least one of those components. Of course, neither of these items are vegan. Our nieces both complain, and as we need mealtime to be relatively stress-free for the boys, it's caused some problems. On top of this, we also have four dogs. One family dog, one dog who is a trained autism service dog, and our eldest daughter adopted two dogs at the beginning of April last year. Our oldest is doing an animal welfare course at college and plans on becoming a vet slash dietitian. She explained the benefits of raw food, and as such, she prepares all four dogs' meals in the morning and refrigerates their evening meals. We don't force her. She chooses to do the other two dogs because she wants to get it perfect for them. Anyway, our two nieces are complaining about never being able to eat because there's always meat around. They refuse to eat at mealtimes because we serve meat and dairy. I explained that we aren't going to upturn meal plans we've had in place for years just for them. They could either deal with it or make their own food. They're both on hunger strikes, but I don't think I'm in the wrong. I offered to serve the sides, which are generally vegan, in larger portions for them. But cooking several different meals is not something I want to go back to. My sister is staying out of it, and her husband is just happy he's finally getting to eat meat again. My wife thinks I'm being harsh, but when I suggested she take over cooking, she suddenly agreed with me. Am I the jerk? What do you think? Is OP the jerk, or are his nieces? Please let us know. Beggars can't be choosers. Next. Neckbeard tries to buy cheap parts to save money on his PC build. Since my last story went over so well, I guess I will share another from my time at Macropoint. Now, some people believe the customer is always right. This is a problematic belief. The truth is, most of the time, the customer is an entitled jerk, but you're supposed to perform admirably anyway. This gets harder when you're dealing with anyone who thinks they know something that they do not. So a guy comes into my department and I greet him at the carpet. I tended to be Johnny on the spot whenever someone came in. Welcome to our build your own department. I'm Animouse. What are we putting together today? The man scoffs at me and says, 
A computer, obviously. All attitude. He was a neckbeard, wearing a My Chemical Romance shirt, pants so tight that he had a mushroom top and a mismatched shoes. This was obviously on purpose, as both shoes were clean, just didn't fit his look. I didn't take much time examining him. My dad had always told me I got to get the measure of a man with a glance and look him in the eye the whole time. He literally used to test us on this crap. Turn, look, then tell him what cars we saw in that split second. I was decent enough at it, but not great. I instead would tell myself little lyrics on the fly to remember key details. It's become a life habit. I explained this to point out that I wasn't staring at his look, so I'm pretty sure the snickering hens in the general section who didn't work for us were the source of his ire about being judged about his look. He took my smiles as me thinking something was funny. I feigned ignorance, like I didn't hear him, and then when he asked again, I apologized and asked him to speak louder. Told him I was hard of hearing. This relaxed him a bit, thinking I couldn't possibly have heard the hens giving him the business. I did, but I wasn't going to show it. With an attitude, he handed me a list and leaned forward shouting, I don't want to be sold nothing. Here's what I need. Go get it. I look at the list and it's pretty thorough. Names of items and SKU numbers. I'm like, bet. This looks like a full build. Good money, though a lot of them I identify as cheaper parts. I tell him it'll take me a few minutes and invite him to take a look around in case he sees anything else he might need. He rudely says he'll wait there and he ain't buying anything else. So don't try none of my snake oil sales crap on him. I smiled and said, Oh no, but it's so good for the joint and muscles. He didn't think it was funny, so I just walked away and got his stuff. Halfway through grabbing his items, I realized that he only looked at prices and not what each thing did. His build had an AMD processor, but he wanted an Intel board. The case he wanted was slim, and the video card he wanted would not fit. He needed the lower profile, though the Intel board had integrated graphics, so I wasn't sure why he picked a card. Also, the power supply he wanted was of lower quality and wattage than the one that came with the case. All in all, I was compelled to ask what the heck he was trying to build. I gathered everything quickly and brought it up, going over each piece with him and getting his approval. I then asked him if all of this was for the same build, which he replied with a something smart like, Wow, how observant of you, or something like that. I smiled and tried to inform him that some of those parts would not work together, but he simply cut me off. Listen, I don't need you trying to upsell me. I've been building computers for a while. I know what I'm doing. He did not, and I wanted to question that validity of his claim. I asked him then if he would like to hear about our return policy just in case. He got belligerent, telling me he knows what he's doing and how dare I treat him like he's stupid just because of the way he looks. Granted, he did look stupid, but I think his ire was more for the cute girls giving him crap and some insecurity versus anything I said. Alrighty, you are not interested in our return policy or extended warranty policy, right? I confirmed. We're supposed to ask about the warranties for everyone, but I figured he was not going to take kindly to that, so all I wanted to do was cover my basis. Warranties are for suckers. Do I look like a sucker? He snapped. Yes, he did, but I wasn't going to say that. I just smiled at him and asked if I could double check his list to see if I got everything. I whipped out my phone and took a picture of everything along with the list. I knew most of this was coming back and let him go about his day. I didn't even sticker it. I knew what was coming. Two days later, Neckbeard shows back up. Muffin top, two different pairs of shoes, and an anime t-shirt that made Goku look like he had a fisheye head. He looked embarrassed and angry. He had with him someone who I at first thought was his girlfriend, a little Latino woman who I was certain was either blind or a gold digger, but turned out to be his sister absolutely no resemblance. She was friendly and told me she was trying to build a gaming computer to play Crisis. I was a little incredulous, young, and to be honest at the time did not think girls played games like that. So I turned to him and said, Crisis? And he shrugged. Little lady stepped up and reiterated herself with a bit of friendly mocking because she knew what I was thinking. Apparently she got crap for being a gamer girl. I just shrugged and told the truth. There was no way in heck that previous build was going to play Crisis very well. The brother, whom I'm going to call Neckbeard from here on out, had an attitude. He said yeah and handed me another list, this one similar to before. He made no explanation for his previous mistake and just told me to get the new items, along with the same line about not upselling him. I looked at the list and knew right away that build wasn't going to play that game very well. 
I mean, I could get him there with a $1,500 build, barely, but this was something like $900, and that video card, don't remember what it was, was not going to cut it. I told him so, and that maybe he should look at the game specs online, which would help him make a better decision. He told me he had done his homework and to just get what he said. I looked at his sister, pleading, and told her that I could come up with a system that was both affordable and would run the game decently. He interjected and got mad, threatening to get another salesperson. I said okay, but I knew he would be back again. As I'm getting his stuff, I hear him, away from his sister, on the phone. He's telling someone that he wants to finish this up and get the build done. Apparently, his parents had allocated some money for this, and he was trying to get a cheap system so he could keep the rest of the money. A real jerk move, but not my problem. I gathered what he asked for and sent them on their way. Didn't tag this stuff either. It was either coming back or could go to the pool. I saw Neckbeard two days later with little sister in tow and his parents. He was not dressed like a disaster that day. His parents did all the talking. There was no list. They told me they had trusted their son to get this done because he was good with computers, but the game wasn't working properly and they were trying to get everything together for their daughter's birthday, which had apparently passed after the first time I met Neckbeard. The parents then told me they only had $3,000 to spend on this computer. They had looked up the average price of high-end gaming rigs and wanted to buy an Alienware, but were convinced by their son to build it themselves, possibly so he can control what they spent. $3,000? This man was trying to snake his parents out of like 2,000 bucks with these crappy builds. They told me to put together something that would work, and I smiled at Neckbeard and said, With a $3,000 limit? They confirmed, and I grinned. Cue malicious compliance. I tell them I can definitely do that, and ask if they want to come with me and discuss each part piece by piece, and why I think they need it for the game. I go with them, and I build a $3,000 system. Neckbeard is losing his crap. Why do we need this? Why do we need that? But no one will listen to him because of his previous failures. I built a system that I'd be proud to own and got it around $2,700 and then explained the warranty and how they would have us build it and have parts and labor on that warranty. Of course, they took it. Neckbeard was angry because we went a little over and I even talked his parents into getting a boss monitor for the game. These, I certainly stickered. If Neckbeard hadn't been such a jerk, I'd have built him a system that could play the game and he would have been able to go about his fiendish plan and keep his parents change. Instead, he got nothing, and his sister got a build that she loved, and a case that she apparently always wanted, a white Antec with purple fans. Moral of the story is, don't be a jerk to your salesman. Tell them what you want and need, and they will accommodate most times, or at the very least, know what the heck you're doing. If he had known computers like he claimed, this wouldn't have been an issue. Either way, I'm glad things didn't work out for him, and this time, there were no returns. Speaking of computers, have you ever played any PC games? And if so, which ones? Please let us know. Minecraft and Among Us for the win. Am I the jerk for pressing charges when my stepson took something my daughter inherited from her mother? I, male 47, have been with my wife for two years. She has a 21-year-old son. I have a 14-year-old daughter from my previous marriage. My late wife passed away in 2014. She left a few things for our daughter, including a gold jewelry set. Her mom was devastated she didn't get to gift the set to our daughter on her wedding day. I keep it in my closet since it's expensive and my daughter is too young to have it. I'll hopefully gift it to her on her wedding day. Last week, we were sitting in the kitchen when my stepson was hesitant to ask me something. We're in good terms, but have our fair share of arguments. He said his fiance was taking something from his mother's and my closet, saw the jewelry set and liked it very much. He asked if he could borrow it so his fiance can wear it at her cousin's wedding. I found this unacceptable and I told him his fiance had no business being in the bedroom and that the jewelry isn't mine, it's for my daughter. He asked me if my daughter will agree to let him borrow it if he talked to her. I told him not to even talk about it again. He got all upset and said things I do not remember. Saturday night, when he and his fiance were at the wedding, I discovered that the jewelry set was gone. I told my wife and we looked all over the house. I called my stepson to tell him about calling the police because I really thought someone stole the set. He said there was no need, that he borrowed it and will return it after they get back from the wedding. I yelled at him and told him to come back with it right then. I kept calling him till 12 a.m. when he told me to stop calling and that he'd bring it in the morning. I couldn't sleep that night. I felt terrible. In the morning, he showed up at 10 a.m. He didn't bring it and started stalling, saying he forgot he'd bring it the next day. 
At this point, it was clear he gifted it to his fiance and was stalling. I got so mad, I told him I will be pressing charges if he doesn't return the set today. We got into an argument. My wife said his fiance was the one who wanted the jewelry set, but he was the one who took it and it's not even mine, it's my daughter's, which made it worse because I'm responsible for whatever happens to it. His grandparents berated me after I told him this and got mad and defended him when I said that I will be pressing charges. He stole and needed to be responsible for his actions. He didn't respond to my final calls, so now I've given him one last chance and it's over. I press charges today. They're saying calling the police was extreme and cruel. They're all convincing me to back down. Am I the jerk for pressing charges? He was replying to me sarcastically when I said I'd get the authorities involved if he didn't take me seriously. His mom said she had tried to talk to him, but I had enough of him stalling, hoping I'll just let it go so he can make his fiance happy. I feel like an irresponsible idiot. I can't even look at my daughter without feeling frustrated and infuriated. I'm hurt, but what's worse is that this is my daughter's property that I couldn't take care of. My wife allows them into the room, although I told her not to several times, and they're not kids, and there should be some boundaries. I just needed to mention that we're in Europe. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk? Or is his stepson? Please let us know. It's not often these stories make me angry, but this one really did. I hope that punk rots in jail. My school spends $1,200 going behind my back, ends up letting me get out of a week of classes. So this happened years ago, 2009, when I was a junior in high school. I was 16 at the time and a theater kid at my high school. Specifically, I was what we referred to as a techie, meaning that we did all the technical aspects of the show. Things like building the sets, lighting, sound, and makeup, among other things. Now, my school was in a pretty affluent area, suburbs of LA. We were near Malibu. Because of that, the arts were a pretty big deal for the school and community. I focused on the lighting aspect and really enjoyed it. I was never really popular at school as I always felt out of place. I grew up in a different area and did not know anyone. Also, my family didn't really have money like everyone else. We lived in a trailer park, so I was self-conscious about that. So I kind of threw my whole life into the theater. I normally would not leave school until 11 or 12 at night since we were always either getting ready for a show or striking from the last show. Since I spent more time in the theater than I did in class, I knew things about that building no one else in the school did. It got to the point where I was basically an employee for the school. I ran every function which utilized the theater or auditorium and had keys to every building. Thinking back to it, I'm not sure how legal it was. Normally there are special lights used for theater, but our director that year, it was her first year at the school, liked to add normal lamps and lights to the sets themselves. She was a horrible person and very mean to her students and actors, especially the tech side. She hated me because I did everything I could to keep her away from my crew. I could really look out for the actors, but if she tried to yell at my crew, I would intervene or they would walk away and tell her to take it up with me. By this time, I had become the informal leader of the techies and nothing really could happen in the theater or auditorium since I was the only one who knew how to keep it all working. I kept trying to explain to her that this was not good practices or probably even safe as I was not an electrician. We had an old system and I had to rewire stage pins, special plug slash socket for stage lights as they draw far more power to work with a regular three prong that you would use in the house. She, however, really wanted the set to look like a real house so I followed her wishes and rigged it up. Now this is where things started to go wrong. Every light gets plugged into a specific socket with a specific number which corresponds to a specific slider on our lighting board in the back. Our board was an old mechanical one because the school didn't want to upgrade to the newer one. If the slider was pushed too far up, the normal lamps, what we called bulbs, would burn out and cause the dimmer switch, think a big breaker, to flip. My only solution to this was to put tape on the slider, making sure it could not get to the point which would cause the breaker to flip. This normally would work, but since we would run a show for four weeks, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and two Saturday shows, we were blowing through lamps and tripping the dimmer switch once or twice a week. On our final show closing night, the dimmer switch tripped and we had to call a five minute so I could fix it. Only this time, flipping the dimmer back wasn't returning power and worse, all the other lights were out as well not just the one I had wired myself. Pretty quickly, I figured out the issue wasn't the dimmer switch itself and had to be something else since the whole box lost power. I was pretty sure what the problem was but did not say anything yet as I hated this director and wanted to see what she would say. She started to yell at me before I could explain. Luckily, the assistant principal was there and we were cool so he asked me what we needed to do. 
I told him that I could probably fix it, but I wasn't sure how long it would take. While I had a pretty good idea what the issue was, I didn't want to make promises I couldn't keep. The director heard this and said she no longer trusted me with this theater and she wanted to hire a professional to look at the dimmer box. She was saying since I broke it, I obviously did not know how to fix it. I shrugged and said okay, but a technician from the company is going to be expensive and we have an old system. I offered to at least try first and maybe save the school money. She flatly refused, so closing night for that show ended before intermission and the school refunded all the tickets. That Monday, I learned she managed to convince the principal to hire the technician and that he will be there later that week. I don't remember the exact day. So I get pulled out of class to help show the technician the box, explain what went wrong, and help him if I could. Once I show him the dimmer box, he takes one look and says the company no longer makes that model and he has no idea how to fix it. He spent 30 minutes or so playing around with it but couldn't get it to work and honestly, I don't think he cared that much. After school, the principal said they ended up having to pay him $1,200 and the director probably would not be coming back next year. He asked me if I could try to fix it. I said yes, but it might take me a few days and since rehearsals took place after school, I could only work during class hours. He excused me from all of my classes. At this point, I already knew what the problem was because I came in on Sunday alone to test my theory. See, the building has two separate breaker boxes. The main one everyone knows about, which is in the back next to our panel saw, and the one only I knew about, which was behind the dimmer box. Since the dimmer box was bolted to the wall, no one bothered to check. I only knew because the year before, I dropped a wrench behind it and had to unbolt it to get my wrench back. I fixed the problem in less than an hour, told the principal it would be a good two or three days, and just spent that time working in the theater, messing around with my friends, and getting a head start on the next show. Am I the jerk for telling the people in my church why my brother stopped going? My brother, 32, male, is a doctor at our local state hospital. He enjoys the work and is very happy with his profession. However, he puts in nearly 70 hours a week and that isn't helped by what's going on. The issue is, once people learn my brother is a doctor, they treat him like free healthcare. He really can't go anywhere where people know he will be without being stopped and asked for his opinion or his advice. My brother doesn't keep this a secret and he has told people before that he's trying to enjoy his time off. He always apologizes, however, it's rarely enough for people. My brother stopped going to church with our parents, which my father understood. It got to a point where my brother started joking that he was going to need to open up a clinic in the church just to get out by noon. My mother wasn't happy with the joke and she was pretty upset that he stopped going to church with them. It's not really a secret in our family, there is a source of pride from my mom but my brother doesn't care anymore. People have been asking where he is and I told them the truth. I told them my brother worked non-stop all week and when he was off, he shouldn't be expected to work. Everyone seemed taken aback with my reply and my mom was livid. She said I embarrassed her and it wasn't my place to speak up. My dad told my mother I was right and their son's job wasn't a source of her pride but the son himself should be. My dad went on to tell people his son worked like a dog to help people and if his mind isn't rested, then mistakes can be made. He asked a former cook why he doesn't come over to his house and cook. Yeah, it didn't go over well. My brother laughed but said a church isn't the place to say that. Most of the people are elderly so it's probably not a place he should be if he wants to enjoy being in the crowd. I feel bad but I think these people need to be told. Am I the jerk? Edit. Service is being held outside and we are socially distancing. I'm aware that many of you think that it being held at all is ridiculous. If you've ordered takeout once since March, you're a hypocrite. You're financing people working together in close quarters. You've gone grocery shopping, right? Did you go at one in the morning to avoid crowds? Where did you shop? Why a supermarket where you force people to work closely together? Farmers markets are a thing. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. I feel personally attacked. Leave me and my takeout alone. Customer returns damaged merchandise, but swears it was like that when he bought it. Seriously? Back in the mid-1980s, I worked at a chain record store that sold records, tapes, t-shirts, and other music-related items. One day I was standing at the front register waiting for customers to check out and in walks a very angry looking man. He tosses two 45 RPM records on the counter and said, I want to return these. I looked down at the two 45s and noticed that they were warped. And when I say warped, I mean they had more waves than Farrah Fawcett's hair on her famous poster. These 45s put Shirley Temple to shame. It was summer, so it was pretty obvious that these records were left in the man's car all day. 
I said, sir, we can't take these back. They've obviously been damaged by the sun. I kid you not. He looked me square in the eyes and said, I didn't do a thing to them. They were that way when I bought them. Now, I want a refund. Dumbfounded, I asked, you actually bought them like that? He had the presence of mind to look embarrassed, but recovered quickly and asked to speak to our manager. I called over to Jimmy, the assistant manager on duty, and started to explain the issue. The customer interrupted and said, I want to return these, but your employee here won't help me. Now, Jimmy was an imposing guy with a no-nonsense attitude. I fully expected him to kick this poor, delusional soul out of the store, but he surprised me by saying, Okay. Honestly, to say I was surprised is an understatement. I was shocked. Jimmy came around the counter to the register, processed the return, and threw the 45s in our return box. He turned to the customer and said, Will there be anything else, sir? The customer smiled smugly and replied, I don't know if I'll be back here anymore if y'all hire people like her. Jimmy just smiled and said, That will be fine, sir. We don't want to deal with any more warped records either. The man just huffed and walked out of the store. Jimmy turned to me and said, Better to return $2 worth of merchandise than to lose a good customer. But I think in this case, we got the short end of the deal. Am I the jerk for stopping my friend from getting a job at my workplace after she drove me out of our last job? My friend, Leah, and I met at university. I was a mature student, starting at 23. In our final year, a new lecturer, Jamie, joined the staff. It was his first year of lecturing, and he was only a couple of years older than me. Jamie and I stayed in touch after I graduated. Leia and I got jobs in the same workplace, which had close ties to our university. Jamie and I got closer and eventually ended up dating. When we were ready to tell people, I told Leia, who immediately turned it into office gossip. This didn't cause any professional repercussions for me or Jamie, but because the workplace was tied to the university and it was a very competitive environment, I ended up being the subject of a lot of comments. I decided to find another job. After I left, Leia apologized for spreading the rumor, saying she didn't think it would be a big deal, and I forgave her. But I've not been eager to share much with her since then. This has been reinforced by Leia still being a gossip, telling me about the private lives of all my old co-workers without prompting. Leia lost her job back in June. She told me in December that she had put in a CV at my workplace and mentioned my name, hoping I would put in a good word for her. My supervisor, who does the hiring, emailed me to follow up on Leia mentioning me. I said I worked with Leia, and while she was good at the actual work, we'd had some personal issues and explained. I said if they did hire her, I'd work with her and we could be professional, but due to the working environment we have, I'm not sure introducing a gossiper would be a good idea. My supervisor said she'd take that into consideration. Leia didn't get the job. She asked me if I put in a good word for her, and I hesitated when responding. She then directly asked if I gave her a bad reference, and I told her that I'd been honest and said she was a good worker, but I wasn't so sure about the culture fit. She lost it, calling me a fake friend and accusing me of sabotage, particularly as I previously forgave her for spreading the rumor at my last job. She wants me to email the supervisor back and retract the second half of my statement and ask them to reconsider her for the role. I've refused because I said what I said, and if I go back on it now, I look like an idiot. Plus, I'm pretty sure they hired someone anyway. Leia's called me a jerk and demanded I put this right. Am I the jerk for not helping her get hired here? Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or is Leia? Please let us know. Definitely Leia. With an attitude like that, no wonder they blew up Alderaan. Entitled mom pushes me away from my family in my wheelchair. A few years ago, I was living in Vegas and an entitled mom literally wheeled me away from my family. I have a number of health issues and after a few botched surgeries and neurological damage, I was bedridden. I never left my house slash bed except for doctor's appointments. I hadn't been out at all for two and a half years. I had worked really hard on my daily physical therapy and my balance had greatly improved. My family came out for a visit. My husband was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base and I was so excited to surprise them with my improvements. I could stand and walk and was actually wearing pants. To celebrate, I wanted to go see the fountains at the Bellagio. For most people, this is a nice outing, but for me, this was years in the making. I was nervous I might get overtired and lost in the fast moving crowds, so we had to bring my wheelchair. We knew the schedule for the fountains and arrived super early to secure a spot in front where I could see from my chair. It was such an important moment for all of us. We lined up by the fence and no sooner did the show start, I felt this jerking on my wheelchair. I thought maybe someone had tripped on me and I immediately looked up to apologize. 
I was pretty self-conscious and ashamed of being out in a wheelchair in such a big crowd. When I glanced up to apologize, I see this lady with a small kid on her hip, using one hand to literally pull me away from the fins. Because she was only using one hand, she spun me completely around to face the street. I was stunned. I could hear everyone reacting to the fountain show, and here I was, looking dumb, awkwardly facing a bunch of strangers. I yelled for my husband, but he couldn't hear me over the noise. I looked behind me, and this woman had plopped her kid up onto the guardrail, never made eye contact with me, never said one word to me, and had treated me like a piece of luggage. I tried to stand up, but the people around me had crowded me so much, I didn't have room to push my chair back enough. I desperately looked around at the strangers in front of me, hoping that someone who had seen what had happened would help. It then dawned on me that this was a huge family slash friend group. They all began nudging me aside, further and further away from my family. It all happened so fast. I found myself pushed into the walking area where people who weren't stopping to watch the fountain show were quickly trying to walk past. People couldn't see me through the crowd and were stumbling over slash past me. I couldn't see my family anymore and was trying hard to push myself up out of my wheelchair the way my physical therapist had taught me. I felt someone grabbing my chair again and I panicked. I started yelling, no, please no, and then realized it was my husband. He had glanced to check on me and to take a picture of me being out for the first time and I was gone. He had to fight his way through the crowd, the same family group, to find me. I burst into tears. I didn't know why, but it was like all the trauma from the last few years hit me all at once. I told him they had pushed me away, and after putting it together, my husband was mad. He turned to this group of people and demanded to know who had pushed me away. By this time, the fountain show was pretty much over. The group initially just ignored my husband like they had me until I pointed out the woman with her kid as the culprits. My family confronted her, nicely I might add, and tried to explain why a wheelchair is an extension of a person, etc. She at first pretended like she didn't speak English, but I had heard them talking amongst themselves in English while they pushed me into the walking area and I told my husband as much. She then gave up that act and told my family about how I was in their way and probably couldn't see anyway. And the man with her claimed in a raised voice that in their country, they don't take their shameful family members out in public. To which my husband responded, if that were true, none of you would be here. I was even more shocked by his last sentence than being wheeled away. I managed the courage to tell them what he had said was BS and that I'm sure people in your country are actually kind and would be proud if I was their daughter. I remember the exact words I said because later I was very proud that I stood up to them. The group sort of collectively scoffed, spoke to one another quickly and what I think was Hindi and slowly walked away as if nothing had happened. We didn't stay for the next show because I just wanted to go home. If you want privacy, then move somewhere else, Karen. I live in an apartment with three bedrooms, one large room, a smaller room, and a room which they marketed as a bedroom, but is essentially a hyped up broom closet that barely fits a one person bed. I use the large room as a bedroom and the second biggest room as an office for my work, which is mostly done online even before lockdown, so I can't do without it and the smallest room is not big enough to house my setup and files, and unless I massively downsize my bed, it doesn't fit in my room either, hence the office. The smallest room is set up as a guest room with a single bed, wall-mounted TV, and a small closet. It's cramped, but given it is usually just used for a few days by my cousins and friends, it works fine. The rest of the place is rather average. Normal apartment, small living room with a kitchen and a bathroom. My mom made a series of very dumb financial decisions since my dad passed three years ago, and with her losing her job due to lockdown, she had to sell her house to pay several debts. Let me be clear that the money she had could have had her living comfortably for the rest of her life without ever having to work again. She called me one day, explained the situation, and after a long argument, I relented and allowed her to move in with me until she got back on her feet which I was angry about because I was on the brink of moving in with my girlfriend and this put that plan on hold for the foreseeable future. Well, since she moved in, it has been horrible. She complains every day about the smallest things. It only got somewhat better when she finally got a job, so she's out of the house for several hours. It honestly feels like I live with my parent when in reality, she lives with me. I obviously put her in the guest room and that has since been her primary aim for complaining. Not a day goes by where she does not complain about wanting the office as her room, as it's bigger. Obviously, that's not happening. Yesterday, she had a friend over. Afterwards, we got in another argument 
where she started yelling at me for not giving her any privacy because I dared to go into my own kitchen to make a sandwich while she had her friend over. I finally lost my crap and said what it says in the title along with some choice words and I have the mind to kick her out at this point, even knowing she's got nowhere to go. She has made a scene about it towards her siblings and other family who have since reached out to me to tell me how much of an ungrateful jerk I am to talk to my mom like that. So I'm here for outside judgment. Well, what do you think? Is OB the jerk or is their mom? Please let us know. You never want to live with a Karen. Just ask Reddit boy over here. Father doesn't understand why he cannot attend his son's doctor's appointment. His son was 30. I work at a hospital as a desk lady. This man came in with a younger man and approached my desk. If some of you don't know, many hospitals have restrictions nowadays. There are certain types of appointments where a patient can have a guest with them, but I would say about 80% of appointments are restricted so that it has to be just the patient. Unless, of course, the patient is a minor, cannot speak English, or is not of sound mind, has a disability that restricts their ability to communicate. Me. Hi, how can I help you today? Father. I'm here for a doctor's appointment. Me. All right, can I have a name, please? Yes, my son's name is Name. He's here to see Dr. Name for this department. Me. It's for your son? How old is he? Father. He's 30. Me. He's 30? I'm sorry, sir but I can't allow you to go back with him. This kind of appointment doesn't allow guests with a patient. But my son doesn't know what to tell the doctor. Oh, I see. He doesn't speak English? What? Of course he speaks English. Me. Oh, I see. Does he have a disability, sir? Even with his mask on, I can see the father's face twist into a scowl. Please know that this entire time the son has not spoken a word, he's just stared at me this whole time. Father. Excuse me? No, there's nothing wrong with him. Me. Well then, I'm sorry, sir, but due to the recent circumstances, I cannot allow you to go back with your son. He has to go by himself. But he doesn't know what to tell the doctor. He doesn't even know where the office is. Me. I can walk him to the office, sir. You'd have to tell him what to say now. In the meantime, I'll need to check you in. Can I have a name again, please? Finally, the son mumbles his name, but the father cuts him off to say it very loudly. I get him signed in. The father takes a few minutes to talk to the son and I step out from behind the desk to walk him to the department. When I get back to my desk, the father is still standing there. Me. Hello, sir. Do you need anything else? No, I'm waiting for my son. Me. I see, sir. In that case, I'm going to have to ask you to wait in your car. We also have restrictions as to who can be in the waiting area. Well then, how will I know when my son is done? Me. He'd have to call you. Does he have his phone on him? The father didn't answer me. He turned around and walked back out. About 20 minutes later, he came back in. Father, is my son done yet? Me, did he call you? No. Then he's probably not done. But how do you know? Can't you call and ask where he is or how long the appointment will take? Me, no, I cannot do that, sir. I definitely could, but I had no intentions of entertaining him when I had other people to help. Father, there's really nothing you can do? There's always something that can be done. This is ridiculous. Me. There's nothing I can do. I already took him down there. All you can do is wait for him to finish the appointment. The father finally left. About another 15 minutes, he rushed back in right past my desk. Me. Excuse me, sir. Where are you going? To pick up my son. He called and said he's done with his appointment. I'm going to go get him. Me. Sir, you cannot go back to the office. Even if I let you, you would be escorted right back out. You need to leave the hospital and go back to your car. We have very strict restrictions due to what's going on. Father. But what if he doesn't know how to get back? He'll get lost. Me. Then he can ask one of the nurses to bring him back. I cannot allow you to go back there. It's not my decision. I did not make these rules. Please leave, sir. So finally, the son came back out, being escorted by a nurse. The father came back in one more time. Me. Wishing that I could get away with yelling at someone, even just once. Yes, sir. How can I help you? Father. I just wanted to make sure I get your name. Your behavior has been so shameful, and I will be filing a complaint against you. I don't know how you people can sleep at night, being so heartless and cruel. Me. All right, sir. Have a good day. And finally, he left for good. I was ready to start shouting at him to get out. I heard later from one of the nurses that he called the desk down there asking if he could come in. 
Of course, since the son was 30, spoke English, and was of sound mind, and had no record of disabilities that limited his communication, the answer was no. And of course, he flipped out at the nurse too, apparently calling her heartless for making his son go to the appointment alone. He apparently told her that he always comes in with his son and he's never been stopped before, so he should be allowed to come in again. What do you think? Should the dad have been allowed to go back with the son or not? Please let us know. Helicopter parents much? Am I the jerk for ending my daughter's birthday dinner because she called me and my wife unethical? I, 61, male, had been married to my wife, 31, female, for three years. Around summertime 2020, she started saying that she had for the longest time thought she would be okay as a child-free person, but she's been feeling this unbearable itch to have a kid that she can call her own. She discovered that she was pregnant two months ago and was so excited she cried. My daughter, 29, female, and I have birthdays one week apart, so we invited her over to a joint birthday dinner at our house. We saw it as a good chance to break the news that she was going to have a new half-sibling. When my daughter and her soon-to-be husband had taken their seats, I broke the news to them. An awkward silence descended, and my daughter crossed her arms across her chest and said, I honestly, wow, I can't be anything other than shocked right now. Her boyfriend interjected an awkward congratulations. My wife was really upset and asked my daughter to elaborate as to why it was too much to just be happy for us. My daughter said, Dad, you know you're not 31 anymore. God, you barely chased me and my brother around. Are you going to do that now? I mean, have you thought about graduations? I'm sure the wedding age will be 35 two decades from now. When her boyfriend tried to interject, her voice rose and said, No, I can't not feel bad for my half-sibling. I'm going to get attached and then have to deal with a college kid being depressed that their friend's dads are young. She started crying and called both of us unethical as heck for doing this. She excused herself to the bathroom and my wife looked extremely upset. I realized I couldn't sit through a dinner after she insulted the both of us when my wife was already stressed from her pregnancy because gestational diabetes runs in her family. When my daughter came back and said we could talk about something else, I said, I think it's better if we end the dinner then. She got mad and said she cannot believe I'm kicking her out for speaking her mind. She protested and said she wanted to stay and celebrate our birthdays, but I insisted that she leave. She said thanks for ruining the night and her birthday next week. Am I the jerk for ending birthday celebrations for the both of us because a lot of things that were said were offensive and too emotionally charged? Her boyfriend seemed relieved. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or is his daughter? Please let us know. Oh, I can't wait to see what our audience thinks about this one. You won't pay $100 for a new hard drive? Okay, enjoy paying $22,000 for my time to deal with the problem. I had a job where I had a computer which was, incidentally, also the web server for a very important internal web application. I thought this was really stupid that it wasn't in a server room being managed by IT, but for some weird reason, they wouldn't do it. I didn't use this application or have anything to do with it, but it took up a large chunk of the hard drive and made it slow. I didn't even know what it was on the hard drive, so there was a bunch of old development software I could never remove for fear of harming the application. I was also not permitted to turn the machine off or even sign out nights or weekends so it would be running whenever anyone needed the application. I had to just lock the screen and leave it. This application was apparently something developed by my department before I joined the company and everyone involved with it was no longer there and nobody really knew anything about how it worked other than that this machine had to be running and signed in and it wasn't developed in our normal system and wasn't in our code repository. By the end of my time with the company, they had had such turnover that I was literally the only person in the department who knew it was even there. I was a web developer and I required a vast amount of disk space for my work for reasons mostly relating to how moronic management was about process. I had to keep three complete copies of everything the company ever developed. I often ran out of disk space. I had to use increasingly desperate measures to deal with this, up to and including deleting anything that Microsoft included with Windows that I didn't actually need, like the camera app on a PC with no camera. It quickly got to the point that I had to call IT to tell them my PC was becoming unusable due to disk space and could they please do something about it, and suggested that because of this application, they might want to take this PC into management and give me a different one. I thought that they would do something like replace the computer. Identical would be fine, as long as it didn't have this application on it. 
or give it a larger internal disk, or maybe even just attach an external disk. I would still have a slow machine, but I'd have had the space to do my work. But they told me that I'd have to remove what I could and defrag the disk to make more space, and I would just have to suffer and please don't call them about this again. I talked to my boss and was told that IT's word was final and I would just have to deal with it. So it'd get bad. I'd remove what I could and start a defragment and the machine would become too slow for me to use for about 24 hours during which time I could do no work. This happened about once a week, so it took me about one fifth of my time, not counting time spent looking for stuff to delete. I kept telling Manglement this was happening and they kept telling me to shut up and deal with it. But at least when they wanted me to do stuff and it was, I can't. My computer is busy clearing disk space and is presently unusable. They moaned but understood and left me alone. So because IT was too lazy to do anything and management was too lazy to go to bat for me and the company was unwilling to spend $100 on an external hard drive, they got to spend over $22,000 a year on salary for me to sit around and wait for the machine to make some space so I could do my work. That wasn't my salary. That was the portion of my salary that they were wasting on this problem, not counting the value of the time of everyone else that had to do my work while I couldn't. Oh, and it was getting to the point that I wouldn't be able to deal with it at all. There wasn't anything left to delete and defragging wasn't reclaiming any more space and the company's internal software took up more and more space every day and I estimated I had about a week left before it became fully unusable when I had a heart attack and a stroke and never went back. I occasionally think, with admittedly some glee, of the panic it must have caused when they no doubt turned off the computer and sent it to IT to be wiped and a few hours later, panicked users started calling demanding to know where their precious application that they couldn't live without was, only for my evil manglement to say, honestly, what application? Entitled Mom Blames Me for Stealing 100,000 Rupees From Her Some background info. My mom set up my bank account when I was about 15 so it would be connected to hers and she could have access to see all my transactions, available funds, etc. She would constantly message me asking what I was spending my own money on. She didn't even pay my allowance. It was my dad who had divorced her when I was young. So when I turned 18, I tried to get my account separated, but for reasons I can't remember, it didn't separate smoothly and she was still able to see a lot of my transactions and funds. Also, this is definitely not the first time she has accused me of something completely irrational or unbelievable. So majority of this happened over the course of last year, but it all started two years ago when my mother asked me to hold some money for her. I'm not sure what her reasoning was for it, but she decided that it would be better for her, at the time 18 year old son, to hold over 300,000 rupees for her in this account as opposed to hers. I was a little skeptical at first as to why she would want me to hold her money, but she said I could keep the interest that was coming in, so I accepted it. Let's get into it. Cast. We've got me and we've got my crazy mother. So Entitled Mom asked me to hold some money for her and to keep it in a savings account. She clearly trusted me and I'd like to think that I'm responsible enough, smart enough, and trustworthy enough person to not steal from someone. Entitled Mom clearly thought the opposite of me at a certain point, but we haven't reached there yet. So after about eight months of me first receiving this money and holding in a savings account my bank, Entitled Mom asked me to withdraw 100,000 rupees and send it to her, which I did. She got the money and we all lived happily ever after for about another 14 or so months. That's when she asked me to withdraw the whole lot and send it over. Again, I did this without issue and she received her money. But when she saw the amount, just over 200,000 rupees, she asked when the rest was coming in. Naturally confused, I asked her what rest she was talking about. She said that I had held 300,000 rupees for her and I told her that she must not remember but I had given her that partial amount previously. She clearly didn't remember. I tried my best to tell her but she did not believe one word I had said and started accusing me of stealing from her and being deceitful. 100,000 rupees is a lot of money and could easily buy you a lot of nice things, things I definitely don't have. This whole argument turned into a two month long fiasco with me telling her multiple times to check her bank records to find it. I eventually had to go into a bank and ask for a statement from that time period to show her and once I did, she did not even apologize or anything. This all ended a few months ago and I've barely spoken to her since, let alone seen her, and I'm definitely considering just cutting ties with her. This is not the first time she's done something like this and she's actually stolen from me multiple times in the past. 
Anyways, I know this hasn't been the most eventful story, but I hope it's given a bit of entertainment to those who've stuck around to read the whole thing. Has anyone ever accused you of stealing money? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. You still owe me $5, Reddit boy. What are you going to do? Sit on me? Okay. My parents used to own a laundromat, and every so often I would help them clean it up slash collect the money. They had a seating area with a few benches for customers to sit on and a few magazines and kids books to read, generally old stuff that was donated or from the dollar store. One day we noticed that all the magazines and books were missing, not a huge deal as they were all months old and cheap books and that happened every so often, so we just refilled the books and cleaned the machines. A few days later it happened again, all the books were gone. Again, a bit frustrating, but not a big deal. We refilled them again and continued cleaning. But then it happened again a few days later, and a few days again after that. We were actually getting low on kids' books and had to buy some more from the dollar store. My dad and I finally take a look at the security cameras for the last few days, and we saw the same guy come in at about 1 p.m. He was short, bald, with a brown coat. He would walk in the front door, go straight to the back, grab all the books, put them in his coat, and then walk out. My dad was upset. He said he was going to take the day off work to wait for this guy and ask him to not come back. I told my dad I would do it as this was a side business for him and I wasn't working at the time. He told me to be stern but to not hurt him or anything. I was there the next day between 12 to 2 p.m. Just before 1.30 I see him. Short, bald, brown coat. Our security cameras weren't the best so I waited until I saw him grab the books before I walked over just in case it was the wrong guy who just happened to look the same. But as soon as I saw him start to stuff them into his coat, I walked over. Excuse me, I'm a theater trained actor, so it boomed a bit and made him jump. Please put those books back. He looked at me, and to be honest, he didn't look 100% there. But he understood that he had been caught. He spoke softly. Ah, I'm sorry. I just like looking at the pictures. I eased back a little. That's fine. You're more than welcome to look at them while doing your laundry, but you're not allowed to just come in here and take them. He put the books back on the table. I'm sorry, he repeated as he quickly walked out the door. He looked like he had just gotten the idea. I quickly cleaned up and headed home. We thought that would be the end of it, until the next day when everything was gone again. We checked the security cameras again and it was him again. This time, my dad went on a Saturday and I saw the camera footage after. Basically the same, but my dad actually reached into his coat and took the magazines out. We didn't have audio, but I could tell he was yelling at him. My dad told me that he told him if it happened again, he was going to call the police and then he asked to make sure the guy understood, which we saw him clearly nod on camera, so apparently he did and my dad let him leave. A few days later, all the books were gone again and the camera showed it was the same guy again. My dad actually took a few days off work and we went all afternoon to the laundromat. We saw him come in once and my dad yelled at him to leave, basically chasing him out with a broom, again telling him he's going to call the cops. Finally, the day came. My dad and I were there as well as a regular customer. He was a farmer, about 300 pounds. My dad and I went to the restaurant a few stores over and picked up some takeout for lunch. On our way back, we saw the laundromat door close just as we left the restaurant. We didn't think much until we go in and the guy was back shoving the books into his coat. My dad lost it and charged at him, yelling about calling the police. He turned and looked at us, bolting for the door. I quickly blocked him, shoving him backwards. He tried to go a different way around a table, but the farmer was there blocking him. Please, just let me leave, he asked. But my dad, who was on the phone, said no, we've given him plenty of chances and he's going to wait for the police. My dad and I are larger guys, and like I said, the farmer was pushing 300 pounds. He looked at us all and smugly said, You can't keep me here. What are you going to do? Sit on me? I heard the farmer say, Okay, as he charged the guy pushing him back onto the bench and he sat right on top of him. The guy squirmed a little, but there wasn't much he could do. He yelled for help, but there was no one around but us. The police showed up and the farmer finally got up. The guy tried to run past the police, but they were able to catch him. Turns out, he was known to police because he would steal small things from the other stores around there. He lived in a halfway house nearby and one of the police who showed up was actually one of his mentors in his spare time. He asked us not to press charges, which my dad said he wouldn't, as long as he never came in here again. He agreed and other than the odd time seeing him walking through the parking lot, 
He never actually did come back in again. We gave the farmer a free load of laundry as a thank you, and I like to think he taught that guy a valuable lesson. Don't mess with fat guys. Oh, my dad was telling me about his call to 911 afterwards. I wish I had a recording of it. He said they said, 911, what's the emergency? And he said, I caught someone stealing my coloring books. And the operator paused for a second and said, um, coloring books? Private property? Not to this Karen. Well, it finally happened. I ran into my first Karen. I'm a volunteer search and rescue canine handler and my dogs are pit bulls. I've been an SAR for 11 years now and never really had much of an issue. Every once in a while, we come across someone who doesn't understand what we do, but after a few minutes of explaining it, people change their attitudes and even get excited because we allow them to follow us and see what we are doing. Yesterday, I was working my younger dog, who is almost ready to certify, but still has some minor issues we are training him on. We are working 20 acres of private property out of the 600 acres available to us. So my dog is off leash, has three collars on him, and is searching wonderfully. I'm watching my dog and I can tell he has human scent. There's obvious body behavior you can see when a dog is on scent versus not. He's working around a large wood pile, about 100 yards from me, when he takes off over a ridge line. A few minutes later, he comes back and jumps on me, which is how he tells me he has found someone. I start to follow him when I hear a lady yelling. By this time, my dog has come back again and told me again he found someone. Still running behind my dog, I come around a corner and there is a Karen in all her glory swinging a hiking pole at my dog. I give my dog tons of praise. I mean, here's a lady screaming at him and waving a scary pole in his face and he didn't care at all. He did his job very well. That's what I want to see in my dogs. Karen, how dare you let your dog off leash? Me, sorry ma'am, I'm with search and rescue and we have permission to train our dogs off leash. No, no dogs are allowed off leash. Your dog is dangerous. Me, ma'am, you are on private property. My dog is training to find missing people. Karen then whips out her phone and starts recording me. You think this behavior is acceptable? Me, yes, that is his job. Karen, I demand to speak to your supervisor. Well, how my team works is we have senior members. We technically have one person in charge of the team, but we are considered supervisors and in charge of everything. We have full rights to speak on behalf of the team, dismiss people for dangerous behavior, make decisions, etc. Me. I am the supervisor. There is someone above you. Actually, no there isn't. I'm sorry you are upset, but what's happened is what my dog is supposed to do. Her. You should ask people before you let your dog run up to them. Me. You are trespassing on private property. You shouldn't be here. What's your name? Me. I am so lost again. Karen. Your last name. Me. You don't need that. Karen then turns to the two men that were with me and takes photos of them and my dog, who is still off leash, playing with his pink pig and laying in the snow. Karen. Do you approve of this? What are your names? Both guys shrugged and said, she's the one in charge. Then finally Karen huffed off yelling and my dog got back to work to find the guy that was hidden 20 feet away from where this whole thing took place. Later she ran into the rest of the senior members and had words about how my dog charged her, acted very aggressive and how I gave him treats for that behavior. They also tried to explain it to her and she told them to hush and there was obviously something wrong with everyone on our team. Oh, and our dogs don't wear vests while working because where we are has tons of underbrush and some of our dogs have gotten seriously hurt wearing vests. We only use them on roadways or during firearms deer season. Am I the jerk for hanging up on my daughter when she called? I, 45, male, have been a single father to Jenny, 21, female, for most of all of her life. As soon as Jenny was born, her mother walked out on both of us and I haven't heard from or seen her since. I tried to contact her, but after five years of fruitless searches, PIs, court dates, etc., I just gave up and decided that I was going to raise Jenny alone. I will admit that I wasn't the best father, working late nights, sleeping when I wasn't working, etc., but I did my best to provide for my daughter. Everything was going okay. Jenny was an average b student, played the flute, did basketball, until she went to high school. Long story short, she fell into a bad crowd and her life fell apart. She started staying out late every night. Her grades dropped to Fs, fighting back against me, etc. I cut back my hours at work to try and be more of a father to her, but she wouldn't have any of it. She said it was too late, 
and once she turned 18, she was moving out of the house and never coming back. I begged and pleaded for her to stay, that I care about her. I apologized for not being there more, but explained that I am human and truly want to make this work. She had none of it, and true to her word, at 18, she packed her bags and left. I tried to get in contact with her and even called her friends, but they didn't know or wouldn't tell me where she was. Again, the most important woman walked out of my life and I was left there alone to pick up the pieces. The next two years were a black hole of depression. I barely had the strength to get out of bed most days, but that all changed when I met Dawn. Dawn was a new coworker and we hit it off instantly. She listened, understood, and helped me pull myself out of my depression. We bought a house together two years ago and we've been making it ever since. Luckily, lockdown has not affected us since we both can work from home. And Dawn told me a couple of weeks ago that she's pregnant. For the first time in my life, I am safe, secure, and I don't have to worry about the future. I can just focus on the present. That is, until last week. I received a call from Jenny, which surprised me because I changed my phone number. She said she was sorry for the way she acted and wanted to know if she could live with me. Apparently, when she left, she hooked up with her boyfriend and thought they would make a happy life together. Surprise, surprise, no high school education and a flaky boyfriend who cheats was not a smart idea. I told her that it was too late. I was finally happy with my current life and I didn't want to deal with her drama. She made her choices and she has to live with them. So I hung up the phone and blocked the number. I feel like I shouldn't have hung up on her like that, but I was still hurt she ran off. So am I the jerk? Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or is Jenny? Please let us know. This is another one that I can't wait to hear what our audience thinks. No microwaves allowed, you say? Another post reminded me of this. This story is most of two decades old, so details are not precise. When I was in college, as many people do, I lived in a dorm. Now, my college had three different groups of dorms. One that was in the main set of buildings that was mostly seniors, one that was mostly sophomores and juniors, and one that was almost all freshmen. The freshman dorm area had beds that were fixed to the walls, desks fixed to the walls, and built-in bookcases. It also had one common room for about 150 students paired two to a room and only one microwave in the common room. We weren't, ostensibly, allowed microwaves in the rooms. It makes sense. There were false fire alarms frequently from burnt popcorn in the lounge area. I can only imagine what horrors a bunch of 18-year-olds would concord in their rooms if they were blithely allowed microwaves. Most people just went along with it while grumbling. But oh no, not me. I was complaining one day about the rule and how those of us who weren't idiots could handle a simple microwave. The RA overheard, laughed, and said I was welcome to try and find a way around it, but she had never found one. Being the nerd I am, though, I went and read the handbook in detail. On page 59, it said, no microwaves. But literally, page 60, it said, any appliance under 1,000 watts is allowed. So I found a microwave that was under that, pathetic little thing at 500 watts, granted, in a Walmart ad. Took the ad and handbook to her boss, the resident's life director. To her chagrin, she had to admit that any appliance under 1,000 watts was allowed, and the handbook did say any appliance after all. She agreed to let me have my microwave as long as I didn't let the rest of the students in on this little trick. I agreed. Customer hits on me, manager called the cops and kicked him out. For a background, I, 28, female, have a customer, 50, male, that I have served a couple of times before. He asked me out sometime in early 2020 and I told him no. The day after Christmas, this man came in alone and sat in my section. I was hoping that he wouldn't recognize me this time because I was wearing a mask and I had changed my hair. Unfortunately, he did remember me, but his meal was fairly uneventful. The issue started when I dropped off his check. As I reached to pick up his payment, he grabbed my hand during lockdown and said, I love you. I was very caught off guard, so I just gave an awkward laugh and walked away to swipe his card and get him out of there. When I walked back with his receipt and card, he asked what I was doing for New Year's Eve and if I would like to go out with him. I replied no and that I would be home with my husband. He said, Oh, I didn't realize you were married, while looking at my wedding ring. He then added, Well, he's a lucky man, with a wink. Gross. I told him to have a good night and walked away, deciding I was not going to go back to my section until he got up because he was creeping me out. I figured that would be the end of it and I could go on with my night. No such luck. He sat at the table for another 15 minutes waiting for me to return. 
I refused to go over there, so I asked other servers to run my food, and I helped run their food to other parts of the restaurant. He finally got up, but then he went and stood by the host's stand for another 20 minutes watching me. At this point, I was feeling super uncomfortable and getting very anxious about him still being there. I finally told my boss what was going on and that I was uncomfortable, so he kept his eye on the customer for me. When he finally left the building, my boss came to tell me that he watched him get in his car and I could relax. About 30 minutes later, my boss started hovering around my section and told me I didn't do anything wrong, but he was going to be spending some time in my section. He did this twice, and over an hour after the customer had left, he pulled me to the side to talk to me. Turns out, the guy never left, and he was still sitting in his car. He had walked into the restaurant twice, looking and wandering around, and went to the bathroom. My manager was worried about me and called the cops on the guy. The cops came in to ask me what happened and asked if we, my manager and I, would like to have him trespassed. My manager told me it was my choice and I said yes because after this I couldn't imagine having to see him again. The cops pulled him out of his car and told him he would be arrested if he ever came back to our restaurant. This incident gave me pretty bad anxiety for a week or two after it happened. Why was he sitting in his car for so long? By the time the cops got to him, he had been at our restaurant for over two hours after he finished eating and paid for his meal. What would have happened if my manager wasn't watching him? I wouldn't have known that he didn't leave. Was he waiting for me to get off so he could follow me? Several weeks later, a manager is still walking me to my car every night that I leave. I'm grateful my manager had my back and took my concerns seriously, but I hate that it went so far. I wish I could be more verbal and stand up for myself sooner, instead of having a freeze and appease reaction. But I do feel like I learned from the situation and hopefully if there is ever another time I'm in a similar situation, I will be stronger. Have you ever had someone really creep you out? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. Every day when I have to look at your face. Am I the jerk for refusing to visit my parents without my boyfriend? I know the title probably makes me sound like an entitled little jerk, but I can't think of a better way to word it. Also, I'm going to refer to my boyfriend as Chris. My parents have made fun of me my entire life. I'm now 24. They make fun of my hair, my clothes, the music I like, my degrees, my future plans, my cats, my height, my friends, movies I like, books I like, and the list goes on. Absolutely nothing is off limits to them. They made fun of me being broken up with once. Any attempts I've ever made to communicate why their jokes hurt are brushed off as me being sensitive and unfunny. I stay in contact because they're absolutely wonderful people to everyone except for me, and cutting them off means cutting off the rest of my family who treats me very, very well. However, they tone it down a bit around our extended family, and they almost completely stop whenever Chris is around. They tried to get him involved once, but he shut it down very quickly, and they haven't tried again. To summarize, they're perfectly lovely as long as there's a witness, so I don't go to their house without Chris anymore. And because it's a four hour drive and Chris and I rarely get more than one or two days off at the same time, he works weird hours. I rarely see them. If they call, I put them on speaker so Chris can hear everything they say. They don't like texting their jokes because my reaction isn't as fun for them. So I've had almost two years of peace. Lately though, they've been getting upset that they never see just me anymore. They love Chris. They really, really love Chris, but they want family time. I won't do it because I know as soon as I show up alone, the jokes will start back up. I tried to explain it, but they tried to tell me everything I described in the first paragraph never happened and that if any jokes were made, it's on me for not being able to shrug them off. Anyway, they're being more and more insistent and starting to drag my siblings into it. My brother really doesn't care either way, but my sister thinks I'm a huge jerk for not even trying. Is she right? Edit. Thank you everyone for responding. I just want to clarify something because more than a few people have brought it up. I'm not going to go to my parents' house alone for any reason. I don't want to secretly record them and play the tape for them, my family or my siblings, because I don't want to have to expose myself to their jokes ever again. I haven't had to listen to one in two years and it's mostly under control. I'm not debating whether or not I should suck it up and go alone. I was wondering if I was a jerk for refusing, period. Thank you again. Edit 2. This has come up a few times too, so I'll address it here quickly. Chris didn't witness anything huge. What happened was, Chris and I showed up at my parents' house and I had dyed my hair again. My mom hates it. She used to be very vocal about it, but then Chris started coming around and she stopped. Anyway, we're there and mom starts asking Chris, 
What do you think of pasta's hair? Chris said he loved it. Mom starts going into, Oh, well, it looked so much better before she dyed it, don't you think? Chris hasn't seen me without the dye in, so that's what he said. Mom started pulling out old pictures of me and kept saying, Doesn't this look so much better? Pasta just looks so better without dark hair. And Chris kept saying, Pasta looks great with both. Pasta would look great with any hair color, but Pasta likes it dark and I love it on her. This went on for a few cycles before Mom realized she was getting nowhere. It took a little longer for her to stop showing Chris pictures of my hair, but it worked and it was dropped. It's not a gotcha story, it was just annoying. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you go see your parents alone or not? Please let us know. I probably wouldn't go see them at all, but that's just me. Guy in armor? He must be in charge. So a bit of backstory. Back in 2018, when this occurred, I had saved up quite a bit of money for my job as a shift lead in the food service industry. So what did I, a 17-year-old male, do with that money? I bought myself a suit of steel plate armor, helmet and all, something I had always wanted to do since I knew what a knight was. I had bought it primarily to wear at the local renaissance festival, but took every opportunity to put it on that I could. And this wasn't some thin ceremonial or LARP stuff. It was the real deal. 16 gauge steel, thick leather straps, over 100 pounds altogether. It could stop a sword. At the time, and currently, I stood at 6 feet 5 inches and weigh a grand total of 140 pounds soaking wet. Not the most intimidating on my own, but with the armor on, I was scary as heck, or so people have told me. Anyways, on to the story. That October, my mom signed my entire family up to volunteer at a nearby hospital's trunk or treat the Saturday before Halloween, a night I had off from work. So I suited up, the rest of my family got into their Renfest costumes, and off we went. When we arrived, we reported to the event director, the real manager, and were assigned our duties. My parents were to hand out candy from the back of their car and keep an eye on the kids walking through, like most of the adults. The youngest of my siblings, 11, was sent to help oversee some of the games going on inside and around the hospital, and the oldest, 15, was sent with me. And what was my wondrous task? Glorified traffic cone. My job was to stand at one of the entrances to the portion of the parking lot the event was taking place in and keep cars from driving through. Here to join the trunk or treat? Go around the hospital to the exit side of the lot and someone else will direct you further. Just trying to leave the hospital? Sorry, bud. You're going to have to turn around. No exit here. There was another entrance, but other volunteers took care of it, and mine was where the line of trunk or treaters would wait while another group went through. It did make sense to put me there, though. If you didn't notice the glow stick lanyard all volunteers were wearing, you definitely noticed the hulking 6'5 guy encased in reflective steel standing in your headlights. And if you somehow didn't, I had a much better chance of surviving getting hit. So there I stand for two and a half hours, directing traffic and taking pictures with a fair few of the kids waiting in line. Most were a bit scared of me, but with some encouragement from their parents and a lift of my helmet's visor to show that I was, indeed, a person under all that metal, they became very excited to meet a real knight. So sometime between two and a half to three hours on duty, I hear a bit of yelling coming from the other parking lot entrance. I didn't think much of it, because there are a lot of people around being loud, especially the kids, so I keep on keeping on. Then, a moment later, just as I finish another photo op, there's a tap on my pauldron, shoulder armor. I turn, and there stands one of the volunteers from the other entrance, looking a bit exasperated. Hey man, sorry to bother you, but can you come with me for a moment? We could use you over here. A little bit confused, wondering if maybe someone needed a bathroom break and needed me to take over or something, I said sure, and followed him back. As we got closer, the shouting got louder, and I started to make something out of it. I don't care what the heck is going on tonight. I want to leave through here. The other exit goes to such and such road, and the construction there is a pain. Where the heck is your manager? I'll make him make you let me through. This is ridiculous. Do you have any blah blah blah? Now, I see a car stopped at the second entrance, and a red-faced man in the driver's seat, with the window down, tearing into the second volunteer's traffic cone. As we approached, the guy who grabbed me ran ahead, blocking the man's view of me as I got closer. All right, man, he said. Here's the manager, like you wanted. About time. I swear to God, I'll... At this point, the volunteer who had me follow him stepped aside and I came forward right next to the car's window. The jerkwad's mouth dropped and his face went a few shades lighter as I lumbered to a stop. 
What's the problem here? I asked, finally figuring out what was going on. I might have made my voice a little deeper than it actually was. The man just stared at me for a couple of seconds, mouth agape, still not sure which was worse for him, the beast in medieval armor, or the fact he saw his own stupid face reflected in my visor. When he finally found his voice again, he sort of pointed ahead of him and mumbled, I, uh, I want to leave through here because the traffic is really bad the other way because of the construction. I didn't let him finish and folded my arms, which wasn't exactly easy. Seriously? You do see all the kids running around, right? The big line, the cars, the games, and you still want to drive through here? Especially with that mouth of yours? I, uh, but... Nope. Don't want to hear it. Stop shouting at my buddies. Turn around and leave the way that isn't full of kids, or I'll have the hospital security come deal with you. I was loving this. I never got to talk to people like this at my actual job. Without a word, he rolled up his window, put the car in reverse, and drove away. Once he was gone, the volunteer who grabbed me high-fived his buddy, then me. Sorry for dragging you into this man, but I couldn't find the actual manager, and this guy was a jerk, and then I saw you, and I knew you would be perfect. I just laughed, and I told him it was no trouble, that it was actually very enjoyable. Then I took a picture with the volunteers, chatted a bit about my costume, then headed back to my post, and finished out the night content with my little revenge against all the Richard craniums in the world. Am I the jerk for feeding my nieces nothing but junk food for three days? I, 28 female, don't work Fridays, and my brother and his wife, both 34, wanted to spend a long weekend away at their beach house, so they asked me to watch their daughter, 5 and 7. I've never had the girls overnight before, my parents usually take them, but didn't feel safe because of lockdown. But they're both awesome and I enjoy them, so I said yes. They didn't pay me anything, but we're family and do favors for each other frequently, so I wasn't expecting it. I'm a vegan, and I've never had them over for more than one consecutive meal, and I've always just fed them easy junk food, like a frozen pizza or boxed mac and cheese. I asked my brother what I should feed them this time, and he said they'd be fine just eating whatever I made for myself. Okay, fair enough. They got here Thursday evening after dinner. Friday morning, I made fruit smoothies, and they were happy with that. Lunchtime, I made them peanut butter and jelly. Dinner is where problems started, and predictably so in my opinion. I made a chickpea quinoa dish, and the girls absolutely would not touch it. I wasn't about to force them to eat something that looked gross to them, so we went to a McDonald's drive through The rest of my meals were going to be as weird and gross, their words. So the next morning, I gave them fruit smoothies for breakfast again, and then we went to the grocery store, and I got chicken nuggets, mac and cheese, and frozen pizza and that's what I fed them for the rest of their visit. They usually eat better than that. My brother and sister-in-law cook almost every night, but it's not like they never get that kind of food, which I think is an important detail here. The girls went home Sunday after dinner. I guess they told my brother they ate nothing but junk all weekend, because he called me this morning and started yelling at me about how I pumped them full of garbage all weekend, and now they're going to think they just get to go to McDonald's whenever they won't eat their dinner. I explained they really wouldn't eat the food I made myself, and he said I should have called him to ask what to do, or at the very least cook them something from scratch that was healthier. I got annoyed and said I did my best. A few days of junk food won't hurt them, and I'm not a short order chef. We argued for a while longer, until I eventually told him to find someone else to watch his kids next time, or at least prep their meals since he's so particular, and then I hung up. I don't have kids, and I really did my best. Am I the jerk? Edit. My sister-in-law just called me to apologize on behalf of my brother. The trip was planned last minute and my brother was apparently supposed to prep some dinners for them and bring it to me. He forgot and sister-in-law was upset to hear that they had been eating garbage all weekend when they were supposed to be sent over with those dinners. She Venmoed me $50 for the food I bought them, a lot more than I spent to be honest, and thanked me for the weekend. I'm sure my brother is going to apologize to me eventually, but I think his tail is tucked between his legs pretty hard right now. I know he comes across as a big jerk in this situation, but he and I have always been super close and he can occasionally act like a huge jerk without it having any impact on our relationship. God knows I've occasionally been a jerk to him in the past and he's always just let it go. Thanks to everyone who commented, my brother is usually very reasonable and normal, so having him blow up on me like this was really weird and confusing. Felt like I was going crazy. Speaking of McDonald's, what's your favorite fast food place of all time? Please let us know. I could really go for some Wendy's right now. Company demands 100 free fabric masks from a disabled, impoverished seamstress. For context, 
I am the disabled, poor as heck seamstress. I had to quit working at 30 years old due to severe full body CRPS causing fatigue and extreme pain. I got hosed on disability and live on $900 a month now. My mom, a seamstress who used to make wedding gowns, taught me how to sew as a kid and I love it. It's awesome getting to make things exactly how you want them, but my messed up nerves aren't as fond of sewing. It can cause a good deal of pain if I sew for too long. It starts with the feeling of a cold yet burning gel slowly spreading from my shoulders down my back and by the end, my leg can feel broken and my feet are on fire. It's lots of fun. When lockdown hit and they announced that fabric masks help, I said, forget the pain, it's worth it, and I began pumping out masks for family and friends, plus some neighbors. I gave away the first 30, but started running out of the right supplies, and with money being so tight, I couldn't afford more. So I asked people to donate $2 per mask if they were financially able to. Some people gave more, including my amazing neighbor. Seriously, one of the best neighbors ever, super sweet lady. Neighbor began asking if I could make masks for her coworkers, and she took them and mailed them for me. Then one day, neighbor texted me to ask if I'd be able to make 100 masks for a company. Apparently, someone who ended up with one of my masks loved it and owns a company with about 100 employees. He wanted to give each employee a mask. The business owner texted me to ask about the order. I said, sure, I can do it. It'll take me about one to two weeks as I work solo and I'm disabled. I'd want $5 per mask as this order is a huge one. I wanted some sort of profit. At that time, many mask sellers on sites like Etsy were charging an upwards of $20 per mask, so my $5 was dirt cheap. In the end, business owner ghosted me. Neighbor finally got her friend, business owner's wife, to admit that he found it ridiculous he was being charged more for a big order. The guy wanted them for a dollar each. Oh yeah, and he felt four days was sufficient to sew them all. That would have meant barely sleeping and landing myself in a wheelchair for weeks while I recovered all for the privilege of losing $100 on the order. It was heavily implied that as I'm disabled, I should have been grateful he was willing to pay at all. By now, I'm far more aware of what my services are worth. I donated, or sold at bare least, the first 200. Since then, I've begun selling on Etsy and have produced at least a further 200 masks since then. I'll never again consider a large order without both a slight markup and ample time. It's simply not worth it. Am I the jerk for leaving a bad review after my cake order was canceled and I was reimbursed with a grocery store gift card? So there's a woman in our community who has a home bakery and she decorates cakes. I contacted her in November about making a cake for my mother's 60th birthday in January. We confirmed the design and flavor as well as the price and date. We spoke again three weeks prior to confirm all details and I paid her the $100 she requested. The night before my mother's birthday, she confirmed my cake would be ready by supper time. This morning, she messaged me and told me that she was unable to obtain the main cake topper because, as she claimed, her friend whose store was making it for her decided not to come into work that day and she wanted to know what I wanted to do. I asked her if she could improvise something and asked how much of the cake was ready and how far into it she was so we could figure out what to do for the design. To clarify, I ordered a chocolate cake with chocolate chunks made to look like a record player with a Queen album on top. The item we couldn't get was the print of the album cover to put on the record. I thought maybe she could just write the word queen and maybe make a simple drawing or something. She never responded about the cake or acknowledged that I still wanted it. Instead, she responded saying, I don't do refunds except for Sobeys, a grocery store, gift cards, so you can see if they can make the cake for you. I told her I can't get to Sobeys today and asked if she can't give me my money back, could I at least get a Visa or MasterCard gift card so I could get to Dairy Queen or another closer store? But she said no and refused to negotiate despite the fact that I didn't cancel the order and was prepared to give her creative license over the design. I got the gift card from her, which was clearly something she had gotten for Christmas and not something she had as a compensation for clients. I ended up selling it for $80 so that I could get a simple cake from Dairy Queen and we left her a bad but honest review. Now she's upset and can't understand why we aren't satisfied. The fact is, if she had already gotten the ingredients and was working on the cake, she wouldn't have just abandoned the project at the last minute and offered a refund. As her own mother said on Facebook, basically, you forgot and had no money to pay her back. I don't know if she really forgot because she had spoken to me the day before, but she clearly either couldn't or didn't want to make that cake today. She feels since she gave me a gift card for the value of the cake that the issue is resolved and we shouldn't be upset. 
We feel she handled the situation badly and deserved the bad review on her page. Are we wrong or should we take down our reviews? Well, who do you agree with? OP or the cake maker? Please let us know. I'd do anything for some cake right now. The coffee machine? Okay, hope you don't mind which one. So this happened just a few days ago in my own home and my partner's ability to do malicious compliance in real life cracks me up. So I wanted to share this one. For Christmas, I got my partner a Keurig. He's an avid coffee drinker and before this, he had a Tosimo. But for personal reasons, we live in my mother's crowded house and the Tosimo, while brand new when opened, came pretty much broken. But it's all he had access to and it's all we could afford. The thing can't run without making a ton of noise, but I know my house too well and can honestly tell you no one takes care of anything. Everyone uses my stuff and constantly breaks it or wrecks it in some way and are woefully unapologetic about it. I'm just used to it. But when I spent all this money on the Keurig, I wanted it to be just for my partner. Since my mother said, no one else drinks coffee in the house, she wasn't really wrong. They, for the most part, drink barely anything caffeinated. However, recently, since the Keurig is left in the kitchen, we've both come to realize that they had intentions of using the Keurig without our permission. Not that we would normally mind, but in the last two weeks alone, about three things of mine have been broken. We weren't taking that risk and moved it down to my room. It has produced no smell and was making no fuss. But while out the other day, I received a text questioning where the coffee machine went. I know she's not that clueless because she's talked to me about the Keurig before when she was considering buying him one for Christmas. She just tried to play dumb so I wouldn't know she wanted it upstairs for them to use it. When I told her it was downstairs for convenience, she went off. It all boiled down to, it can't be downstairs in your room because I said so. And to make it look like it wasn't about using the machine, she even threw in some stuff about moving out if we wanted to live like we had our own apartment and whatnot. I was livid. My partner, however, determined that he wasn't going to let them use whatever Keurig pods they bought and didn't want to tell us they had. So my partner brought his old Tosimo back upstairs. The look on my mom and her fiance's face was priceless. They looked so annoyed and wouldn't even speak to us nor say a word. They won't dare ask why the Keurig isn't upstairs. It's been about two days since then and my mother still shoots us daggers whenever my partner makes coffee. I saw something out of the ordinary in my lobby. A lot of what I see day to day has become normal. Drunk people throwing up. I've cleaned it all up. People telling me that our lockdown breakfast sucks. Yeah, it does. My hands are tied by the county. What I don't see or expect is decency. Sadly, it's in the nature of this business that we have to lower our expectations with our guests without lowering our standards of quality. I'm jaded by the numerous people who are just general clowns and those seeking to take advantage of others' kindness. Tonight, I'm having a rough night. I'm trying to balance my work and social lives. I haven't had a day off with my fiance for some time, especially now when she needs me the most. I have to stay strong, not only for the good of her, and do I love that goofy woman, but for the good of all my associates who are going through struggles as well. Good leaders are those who stay strong without losing compassion or understanding. A few moments ago, I saw a kid, probably eight or nine years old, come in in his snow gear, limping. His mother used one of our luggage carts to move him around. An older guest, not in their party, came in afterwards and stopped. She asked the young man why he was limping. The kid explained that he and his family went skiing and one of the skis twisted his ankle. I've had that happen before and it doesn't tickle. The older woman said that everything was going to be okay. He would wake up the next morning stronger. She continued to say that big people, little people, we all hurt and we all fall. It's what we do next that matters the most, that pain comes and goes. She used to kiss her kids whenever they got hurt so that they'd feel better because she loved them greatly and supported them and that's what we do when someone falls. We love and support them. Now I'm sure that this went over the kid's head but the older woman looked back at me and smiled. It was probably the most genuine thing I've seen happen in my lobby. Am I the jerk for not changing my plans to spend time with my nieces because I honestly just don't care to get to know them? Talk about a change of. I'm an avid hiker slash backpacker and spend a lot of my free time doing things that allow me to engage with those hobbies. Typically, I spend weeks at a time in the summer outdoors hiking, backpacking, etc. I've completed the Colorado Trail twice and have done long stretches of the Continental Divide Trail as well. I live in a little mountain town where it's a cinch to just rent out my place for those weeks. My sister got the bright idea to tell me that she wanted to fly out her two girls to stay with me for a few weeks over the summer. I've never met my nieces, 
I moved away from home when I was 18 and have not gone back to visit, and God forbid any of them visit me. When I first moved, I made an attempt to keep in touch and involve them in my life, but it wasn't reciprocated. No one ever calls me, reaches out to me first, etc. I just bluntly told her that I'm not interested. She demanded to know why. I explained that I spend my summers going all over the place, touching down for a weekend and then heading off elsewhere. She said that I could change my plans for one summer and that it was time for me to get to know my nieces. What I really heard was, I've been cooped up with them for this past year due to lockdown and now I want to make them someone else's burden. Here, you take them. I told her that I wouldn't be changing my plans. She told me that this was my chance to make up for being a crappy member of the family and moving away and that her girls just wanted to get to know their aunt. I asked why she thought me getting to know my nieces was beneficial to me in any way, as in what would meeting them do to enrich my life? She didn't have an answer for me, and a few days later, I got a scathing email from my mom telling me that she can't believe I have no interest in meeting my nieces or getting to know them. What kind of person did she raise? Do I want to be part of this family, etc. I don't think I'm a jerk for this. For the record, I don't hate kids or anything. My best friend has three kids, and the four of us go on a lot of adventures together. Well, what do you think? Is OB a jerk or not? Please let us know. Oh, I can't wait to see what our audience thinks of this one. Am I the jerk for refusing to pay for college? I, 51 male, have two kids, Katie, who's 17, and Mark, who's 15. I'm seeing a lovely lady, Alice, who has one kid, Eliza, who's 17. We met because our daughters are friends and have been seeing each other for about 18 months and have lived together for six months. Though we currently live together, our finances are pretty separate. Financially, I do pretty well, and I make more than she does, so I pay about 80% of the house bills. In addition, we both pay for our own individual expenses and for those of our kids. Clothes, cars, cell phones, spending money, etc. It had been going really well, and we were talking marriage, which means combined finances. So we started looking at what a budget might look like, and it went pretty well though we both had to compromise a bit on what we wanted. Then we got to college savings. I put a certain amount of money into Katie and Mark's college funds each month and I assumed we would be doing the same for Eliza. It turns out that Eliza does not have a college savings fund. There is no money set aside for her future education at all. I was stunned. I know Eliza is planning on going to college. Where to go is one of the favorite topics of conversation at the dinner table for both girls. Eliza is not gifted athletically or academically, so there's little chance of a scholarship. I asked Alice what her plan was, and she replied she didn't have one. I pointed out how expensive college was. She asked me how much I had saved for Katie and Mark, so I pulled up those accounts. She said that was plenty. We could just divide it in three. I said absolutely not. I had started saving that money for each of the kids before they were even born, and it belonged to them. She said, what about treating the kids equally? I replied that equally meant giving each of them the same amount going forward, but not taking money away from two of them to give to the other. She said, what about the retirement funds? I said no again, because of both the hit we would take on taxes and what it would do to our early retirement plans. I had worked hard to save to be able to retire early and travel. Alice said it was unfair to Eliza not to pay for her college when I'm paying for the other two, and I agree. But you don't start planning on how to pay for college when the kid is 17. It's not Eliza's fault, but it's not mine either. Alice is accusing me of not caring about Eliza, that I would find a way to do it if it was my kid. I told her that I did find a way for my kids. It was saving for their entire life, not hoping that tens of thousands of dollars would magically appear. It went downhill from there. At this point, Alice and I are not speaking. We won't be getting married, and I seriously doubt we will be together very much longer. I don't think I'm wrong and neither do the people that I talk to. However, I admit they are biased toward me. I am coming here to get an outside perspective. Am I the jerk? Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.